I think we're all assembled. So if anybody else, so just to say, um, as a general note, um, the, the, while, I'm, while, some, while, we're, while we're doing a scene or as someone's talking, um, if you don't mind muting yourself, uh, on the on the on the on the screen, it just means that it, we get a better sound quality, and it doesn't. It's less likely to freeze. Um, so, just to explain to those of you who are new, uh, the the format of this. A lot of you've been with us for a while. Um, my name is Jake Murray. I'm your host. Uh, I'm the assistant director of Elysium Theatre Company. We've been doing these workshops um, since a few weeks into the into the lockdown. Uh, we've done Greek tragedy. We've done three on Shakespeare by popular demand. Uh, last week, not last week, two weeks ago, we did Ibsen. Uh, and this week we're doing Strindberg, and the last in the series is Chekhov, and then after that we'll take requests. So um, if people start saying, can you look at, um, uh, uh, you know, Bulgarian uh, finger puppet theatre, I'll go and do some research on that, which I'm actually <laughs> joking about, I'm not going to do that. But, but if you're interested in, in looking at any other playwrights, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Beckett, Lorca, um, Pinter even, um, or we could look at Wilde or Coward or some other tragedians. I mean, there's Tennessee Williams, Arthur Miller, Eugene O'Neill, a lot of fantastic work. I might not be able to do a workshop on Anna Nakebon because I'm not that versed on him, uh, but I'm sure, I'm sure we can find things to do. So, um, uh, as I say, the format is very simple. I do a fair amount of talking. Um, uh, we also look at scenes from the plays. Uh, and at any point, anybody can ask a question, uh, make a comment. So if there's, um, if you want to ask a question, just either put your hand up or um, you use the hand icon. Uh, there's a hand icon thing, which, which little hand comes up and I'll see you. But it's, it's meant to be interactive in that way. So if there's something that you want to say, um, uh, bring it up. Um, and um, uh, well, the big thing I wanted to also say is that is that part of the point of all these um, workshops is they're supposed to be tailored to the audience so that the idea of this Strindberg one for instance is I'm assuming that, that not everybody knows anything about Strindberg or has even seen any Strindberg or certainly seen all his plays um, and so uh, one of the things I always ask at the beginning of these workshops is um, are there any specific questions anybody wants to ask or anything you want me to address and look at during the workshop uh, because I want to make sure that you all go away <coughs> feeling that your concerns have been addressed. Uh, I'm not a Tory politician. I'm perfectly open to actually answering questions. So um, uh, if, there is an, if there is anything that you want to ask um, about Strindberg or look at in particular, speak now. Or don't. <laughs> Nobody at all? Anything, anything anybody wants to ask? No. Okay. So uh, we're going to start. We always start with a with a with a little scene from or a speech from one of the plays. Uh, now this we're going to start with a really unusual piece of writing. Um, this is from um, the third part of an epic play he wrote called To Damascus in the second part of his life. And this play has never ever been performed uh, in in its entirety in the UK. There's three parts to it, and it's a, a very mysterious piece. This is comes right at the end of the play. Uh, and the main character is a figure called the Stranger. He doesn't even have a, a name, and he's a kind of self-portrait of, of, of Strindberg himself. Um, and in this play, uh, to, to Damascus, the suggestion is that the character is on this long spiritual journey. Uh, and at the end of the third play, uh, he's undergoing a, an initiation, a strange kind of rite, where he is about to be taken on as a kind of monk in a monastery. And he's tempted. He's gone through a long, long process of temptation where all his vanities and intellectual ideas are challenged. And right at the end, the idea is he has to let go of everything before uh, he, can, he can become one of these, uh, this brotherhood. And the last two things he's shown uh, before he undergoes the ritual of death and rebirth, the first thing he sees is a child being born. And then after that, he sees a wedding couple coming out of a church and processing across the stage. And he's at this point, the only other person on the stage with him is the tempter. And the tempter is, one, is the monk whose job it is to challenge him. And so if you can imagine the stranger sees this uh, wedding couple cross the stage, let's have the scene. And there, the best of life and the bitterest. Adam and Eve in paradise, which in a week will be a hell and in another fortnight, a paradise again. Greatest joy, the greatest, the first, the last, the only thing that made life worth living. I too once sat in the sunlight on a spring day on the veranda under the first green leaves of spring, and a small bridal crown crowned a head, 
and a white veil lay like a morning mist over a face that was not mortal. Then came the darkness. Whence? From the light itself. That's all I know. Then it was only a shadow. For a shadow needs light. But darkness needs no light. Enough, or we shall never end. Wonderful, thank you very much. Okay, so the reason why I've chosen um, that particular speech, that particular scene, which almost nobody in this country has ever seen, is the thing that Strindberg is famous for, is this alleged, alleged misogyny, a hatred of women. Uh, he was notorious for it in his time, he was vilified for it, uh, and that's the kind of prime um, uh, charge that's leveled against him but my contention and we're going to look at that as we go is that actually uh what he did explore was the deep traumas that men and women went with each other but he also underwent a massive change in his life uh, which we'll look at uh, uh in which as he was processing that pain the agony that he'd been through everything flipped on its head and the plays turned around and became something very different in terms of how he related to women. Uh, on top of which, even in the darkest plays, the most traumatic plays, there is a deep and profound romanticism, a deep belief in love uh, and even a belief in women, which is why those plays become so painful and agonizing. Uh, and I, in that little speech, which came towards the end of his life, it was in the last great phase of his career, that little section to me embodies it. That, that, that Strindberg in some sense never gave, he was married three times, for instance, he never gave up uh, with the idea that somehow he could make a relationship with a woman work and that it could save him and redeem him uh, and that life could be beautiful as a consequence. Um, uh, you can't actually evaluate Strindberg without looking at his life because so much of his plays come right out of the, of the, of the torment and the blood that he lived through. Um, but uh, my, part of the purpose of this particular um, workshop is to really look at this in Strindberg and show you this extraordinary life journey that he went through, uh, which is reflected completely in his plays. Um, so, um, uh, very simply, uh, Strindberg was the, uh, the other great Scandinavian playwright. Ibsen was Norwegian, uh, uh, Strindberg was, was Swedish, and uh, Strindberg grew up not in a middle class background or an upper class background of any of those things, but a lower middle class working background. His mother was a, a, a servant uh, and his father was a merchant. Uh, and he ne never lost, as he grew older, um, uh, the sense that that was his background, that he wasn't as good as aristocrats and all these other people who were basically in charge at the time. We're talking about uh, the, ni the 19th century. Uh, Strindberg, when he was young, he described his childhood as, as, as extremely uh, uh, harsh. Um, there was bankruptcy and money problems. Uh, his mother was extremely religious. Uh, she was a pietist, and we'll get onto that in a sec because it makes an awful lot of sense, Strindberg's plays. Uh, and he she died when he was 13. He was very unhappy at school, um, and his father then remarried. Um, and from then onwards, Strindberg became very alienated from his father. Um, interestingly enough, Strindberg's favourite novel, bizarrely, was David Copperfield, um, uh, which you would have thought was absolutely bizarre. Why was he reading David Copperfield? But when you read David Copperfield, it's very much about the struggle of a young man who's essentially an orphan, who is thrown out, struggles through school, is a writer, has an unhappy marriage. Uh, and Strindberg always described Dickens as his great teacher that somehow uh, that book, which we often see now as, as quite a, not a cartoonish book, a wonderful book, but not necessarily the profoundest book ever, for him was, was, was really, really important. Um, so uh, the thing that was a call to arms for Strindberg as a young man was reading Ibsen's Brand, which we looked at last week. And he was so inspired by it, he decided, first of all, he wanted to be an actor, which he completely failed at. Apparently he did an audition at the, uh, the big, Stockholm uh, Theatre or one of the big theatres and, and, and his voice went very squeaky and it went a bit wrong so he was completely uh, ignored. Uh, so he then went on to write uh, his first great play which is a play called Master Olaf which is a bit like his um, um, his version of Brand and it's based on a, a real historic character. Um, uh, it's by, uh, Master Olaf himself who was, uh, who was known as the Swedish Luther uh, and this was the uh, a religious figure who as a young man led the charge against the Catholic Church in uh, Sweden and was allied to the young King Gustav at the time. And the play is an incredible play. It's, again, it's never been performed over here except on a fringe production in a cathedral, I think, or, or an old Spitalfields church in the 80s. In, in Sweden, it's seen on the same level as something like Hamlet or, or Henry V. It's, a, it's often done. Um, a few years ago, I think, um, uh, what's, the, what's the wonderful actor from, um, I've got his name now, um, the actor who appears in uh, 
Breaking the Waves, a lot of, lot of American movies. He was in... Um, uh, Evan Skarsgård. Yes, he played, he played him. And Max von Sydow played the same character when he was very young. And this, uh, Strimbo wrote this play before he was 25. Uh, he was incredibly inspired by Brand. It seemed to embody his rejection, his rebellion, his sense of alienation. And he created this incredibly passionate young figure uh, of Master Olaf, who overthrows everything. Uh, first goes into alliance um, with the king. And then when the king uses him to throw out the Catholic Church, he decides he's going to throw out the king. So he tries to lead a rebellion against the king. And again, uh, but for, for Strimbo, the other thing that's extraordinary about it was, uh, although it has this Shakespearean sweep, um, it wasn't written in poetry. He wrote it in prose. We talked um, the other week about how Ibsen, when he wrote tragedies in, in, in prose, uh, he was the first to really knock down the door on that and, and enable tragedies to be written in prose. But what, Strim what Ibsen didn't do was write an epic in prose, and Strindberg did. Um, it's a phenomenal play. He handed it in, and they all said, we're not doing this because it's not in poetry. And it took him years before it formed. I think he, he wrote it in, the, in his mid-twenties and it was performed in his early thirties. And when it was performed, it was a massive success. And he was absolutely st stunned by it. But the frustration that he felt was absolutely enormous. And he um, described uh, the frustration as, he said, it's as, I was as, it's as if I was a, a great painter and I painted all these wonderful masterpieces and I spent most of my life with them in the attic and nobody could see them. Uh, and this was something that happened to him all his life. He's now regarded as one of the great pioneers of, of theatre. He influenced, he's in one sense, for an awful lot of 20th century dramatists, he's more important than Ibsen. Eugene O'Neill apparently went everywhere with a battered copy of his plays in his pockets. Uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf is, is massively based on, inspired by Strindberg. So is Look Back in Anger. Um, and, and the reason being that what he wrote about uh, was was the fury and the torture that can happen in, in marriages and relationships. And he was willing to be ugly about it. He was willing to not be romantic about it. Um, the beauty of Ibsen is that there's an Olympian kind of wisdom to it. Whereas in Strindberg, it's far, far more irrational. Um, and whereas in Ibsen, everybody's scared of acting. There's, there's a kind of reluctance to, to make a decision. In Strindberg, there's no, they don't make decisions, they just do things. Um, it's much, much more impulsive, much, much more visceral, uh, much, much more terrifying. I, of, I often compare um, Ibsen and Strindberg to either, um, if you want to be really highbrow, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, or uh, Coppola and Scorsese. That Strindberg is the kind of guy who'd make Taxi Driver or Mean Streets, whereas Ibsen was the one who'd make um, The Godfather. Do you know what I mean? Um, uh, and and that's, that was interesting enough, the relationship that they had. But Strindberg was initially massively inspired by Ibsen and then loathed him, um, uh, couldn't bear him. Uh, and the reason for that was, was um, A Doll's House. Because A Doll's House, when A Doll's House was coming out, Strindberg's marriage was falling apart. Uh, he was, it was, and it was all being, he was being torn to pieces by this terrible conflict with his wife. They were both pretty nasty uh, about everything. Uh, and A Doll's House seemed to him to be Ibsen betraying men, uh, saying that women could leave their husbands. So he never forgave Ibsen that. Uh, but being Strindberg, he obsessively read it and saw everything that Ibsen ever did. Uh, and although he hissed and spat about him, um, was obviously obsessed by it. Um, and the wonderful thing is that Ibsen returned the, the compliment by buying a portrait of Strindberg. And everywhere he went, he had it over his desk. Um, and it's a famous Edvard Munch painting, which if you Google it, you'll find it. With Strindberg looking like Count Dracula with a kind of cane, uh, with all this kind of energy, um, sort of Edvard Munch energy coming off his head. Um, and Ibsen apparently said, um, uh, I, now, I cannot write another word without that madman looking down at me which is quite interesting. So they, had, they never met, um, but they, they knew about each other. And there are famous stories about uh, an empty theatre doing Miss Julie or the father and the only person watching it being Ibsen. Um, uh, and, um, they were, and at one point, Strindberg was so angry with Ibsen when he wrote Hedda Gabler that he accused him of plagiarising him and used extremely vivid and unusual imagery to describe how he felt Miss Julie had been taken by uh, Ibsen and uh, rebooted in the character of Hedda. And it was very interesting when Alice was playing Hedda last week because she played Miss Julie for me. We, after that, had quite an interesting conversation about how the two characters are very similar. So um, what was uh, powerful about Strindberg um, is uh, in every way he was an experimenter and an outlier. Um, so he wrote his epic uh, drama at the beginning, which he did in prose without being uh, 
of, uh, and then later he 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 went even further than Strindberg in terms of his naturalism. Sorry, Ibsen in terms of his naturalism with things like Miss Julie and the Father, which very very dark and powerful plays. We're going to go through them bit by bit. But the, the other thing he did, he was the first character to write. Sorry, the first playwright to write a truly working class tragic hero, or rather anti-hero. He was the first. Ibsen was the first person to put middle class people on stage as as the subjects of tragedy. Strindberg went one step further and made working class people on stage with Miss Julie. John was the very, very first time that a servant, someone not from the upper classes or the middle classes, but the lower classes um, actually appeared as a major character. We'll get onto that later. Uh, he also shocked everybody with the incredibly frank way he talked about sexuality um, and, and the relationships between men and women. I think Miss Julie's the first play in history where women's periods are first discussed. Uh, that hadn't happened before. Um, and then, uh, even towards the end of his life, he was suddenly completely changing. Uh, he threw out all the naturalism of, that he wrote when he started and started writing these astonishing plays, which are pitched somewhere between our world and the next. Uh, mystical plays, uh, dream plays, uh, plays where suddenly he was pushing into whole new territories of style. Um, and they're not done that often, but they are extraordinary. Um, I've done one of them, they're incredibly hard to do, but they go much, much further than the thing even uh, uh, Ibsen did. And they're much closer to things like Beckett and um, Eugene in Inesco, but they go even further than that. So there was an astonishing journey that this man went through. Um, and throughout his life, he was pretty much rejected. Um, he was seen as a madman. Uh, he was driven out of Sweden. Uh, he lived in poverty for most of his life. Uh, he, most of his life, he was, he was desperately trying to gather money together to keep his family going. And he was endlessly rejected. He had his plays banned. Uh, Miss Julie was actually closed down during its dress rehearsal of its first performance. Um, uh, and he had whole periods of madness. Um, uh, he had three marriages, none of which ended very well, um, uh, and an awful lot of strange affairs. Uh, he almost certainly suffered from mental health issues um, and was very, very difficult. But he also inspired enormous loyalty in people who did know him well. I mean, incredible loyalty. Uh, and when he died um, uh, on, on his deathbed, his first wife appeared, came to see him. Uh, and the story goes, according to Michael Mayer's translation uh, of biography, that, that, that Siri, and we'll get onto her in a bit, because she's quite a legendary figure, couldn't come up the stairs. She, she came to see him, she knew he was dying. She came into the house and she stood at the bottom of the stairs, but couldn't come up to see him. So somehow, the other thing is that every woman that he was involved with insisted that he wasn't a misogynist. And we'll get onto that later as well. <laughs> so a highly complex man. Um, uh, he also, he was very close friends with Edvard Munch. He had a weird correspondence with Nietzsche, um, which coincided with Nietzsche going mad. Um, and there's a very funny um, comment that um, Strindberg made when, when Nietzsche sent him a particularly bizarre letter where he wrote to a friend, I think our friend Nietzsche is mad, as if Strindberg himself hadn't been in those territories. So, um, uh, and even when he died, he'd, had, he'd, he'd been vaguely accepted, but hadn't really um, ever become established. And it wasn't until long after he died that he started to be done in Germany. Germany was the great pioneer of his work. We English thought he was just weird. And remember that the English couldn't deal with, the Ibsen, with Ibsen, so Strindberg was even more nutty. But now uh, his work gets done more and more. Um, and actually about 10, 15 years ago, I remember being in London when there were something like five major productions of Strindberg um, after years of them not being done. Um, so he's a kind of massive figure. Um, for me, uh, when I was young and I was and growing up with my theatre family and I was reading everything, Strindberg was the one that I became obsessed with, not because he was misogynistic, but because the plays are so passionate and intense. Uh, and wild um, and, and the kind of emotional explosion of them um, just felt so liberating. And even when he was saying things that you didn't agree with, um, uh, I found myself wrestling with it. I wanted to refute what he was saying. Uh, and he's been a kind of obsession for me all my life um, because he was, also the, he was also the quintessence of the outsider struggling artist who wasn't understood, who suffered for what he wrote. And he, could, he never gave up. Uh, the interesting thing about him, for the rest of the world, he's seen as a playwright uh, in Sweden, he's seen as a novelist, a short story writer, a poet. He was also a painter, uh, a very good painter. Um, uh, he wrote lots of political pamphlets and for a whole period of his life, he quit all of literature and just wrote science. He spent time doing science. So he was an extraordinary polymathic figure. Um, we, I'm going to dip into it now, but, but halfway through his life, he became immersed in Hindu philosophy, Buddhist philosophy, theosophy and the esoteric alchemy. Um, there wasn't really anything he didn't try and deal with. Um, and as you, if you 
read his work or see his work in its entirety, you see this extraordinary spiritual journey that he went on. Uh, he died very unhappily uh, with some terrible uh, either pancreatic cancer or stomach cancer, and he had um, psoriasis. So when he wrote the Ghost Sonata, as he held his pen, his hands were bleeding. So he literally, as he wrote, um, uh, was, 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 was <laughs> literally wrote his plays with his life, life's blood. Um, well, I, I've done five of his plays. Uh, what I actually love about him, with every single one that I've done, is that you might think there's darkness in his plays, and they are dark, but there's a huge compassion in them too, a massive compassion and an understanding of, of people uh, and the darkness that they go through and the suffering. Uh, and that to me is, is what makes him very special. They're not safe plays. Um, they are um, uh, challenging plays. Uh, he's someone who lived his life with full commitment um, uh, and suffered for it. So um, with all that, going back to Master Roloff, the first speech I want, to, want you to listen to, because when he was young, Strindberg was a massive idealist. Uh, he'd rejected, he still was influenced, he grew up with a very religious mother. Now the thing about pietism, I think we talked about this with Ibsen, is that pietism is a very, not an extreme form of Lutheranism, but it's quite a tough form of Lutheranism. Uh, and Nietzsche also grew up with it. Um, and it's the belief that uh, you have no power over your salvation. Uh, God's grace alone can do it. Um, but also everything that happens is God's will. So if you rebel against something, if you resist something, if you fight against it, you're defying God's will. So it's a completely conformist religion. You're expected to just put up with your suffering. We looked, we looked at this in, in, the, in the Ibsen plays. Um, uh, so, and, and Strindberg, as I say, grew up with this in a, as almost like a kind of fundamentalist um, faith. So this sense of rebellion he had was absolutely massive. Um, uh, he was basically trying to heal the wounds of his childhood. Um, but Master Roloff uh, is him in his early phase when he was a feminist. He believed that women should not have to marry um, unless they wanted to. He believed that women should, in an unhappy marriage, be allowed to sleep in a separate bed in a separate room. He felt that um, couples should, should have sex with each other before they got married because he felt that was an important part of what a relationship was. And if you weren't compatible, you should find out. So he believed fervently in women's rights. He was also a socialist and a pacifist and a disarmament person, all these different things. Um, and all of this is reflected in Master Olaf. The women in that play are wonderfully represented. And Olaf is a kind of young, uh, it's very inspired by Christ figure full of compassion and all those different things. So the speech I'm about to ask Edmund to, 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 to give you is not actually um, uh, Olaf. It's, it's a character called Yet. Now, and Yet is older than Olaf, and he is an old revolutionary. He wants to overturn not just uh, the church, he wants to overturn the king. And he becomes, he manipulates um, Olaf. Uh, and eventually the two of them unite against the king to try and over, over, overthrow everybody, uh, and they're betrayed uh, and they're sentenced to death and this is a speech that uh, yet gives to Olaf um, they've been told that um, they're both sentenced to death uh, and yet has been he's literally about to be hung and this is the speech that he gives Olaf before he dies Edmund our harvest was not ripe Olaf much snow must fall if the autumn seed is to flourish Centuries may pass before a single shoot is seen. They say the conspirators are taken, not the thanks for it, but they're wrong. The conspirators are everywhere, in the king's rooms, in the churches, in the marketplace, but they do not dare as we dared, though it will happen sometime. Goodbye, Olaf. You should live long, you're young. I shall die happy. Every new martyr's name will be a battle cry for a new army. Never believe that any lie ever kindled a mortal soul. Never cease to believe in the passions that shook your heart when you saw someone spiritually or physically tortured. Even if the whole world says you're wrong, trust your heart and your courage. The day you deny this, you are dead and eternal damnation is a mercy to one who has sinned against the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Edmund. Brilliant. So, uh, really passionate speech. You can relate to that speech even now. So you think he was in his tw early 20s when he wrote that. Uh, and the reason, again, why I include that is that gives you a sense of the idealism of this man when he was young. 
He wanted to change the world. And he wrote when he was much older that, that he wanted to teach people uh, goodness and humanity, but life was so awful to him that, that it became something else. But that speech is the unsullied Strindberg. That's the young Strindberg who believed he could go out and change everything. But the tragedy in the play is that actually, uh, after Yet is taken away to be executed, Olaf surrenders. He, he recants and he betrays his own revolution. Uh, and in fact, the real Olaf goes, went on to become um, the, the kind of Archbishop of Sweden. Uh, but it's an amazing play, absolutely passionate. The other thing I would just say, I mentioned this before with Ibsen, all the translations you're going to be here tonight are from Michael Mayer. I've talked about Michael before. Some of you already heard about it. If you're ever going to read Strindberg in particular, I would say the same with Ibsen. Read him in the Mayer translations, because in many ways they're even better than his Ibsen translations. And Michael didn't like uh, Strindberg as a person. He had to write his biography and he, and he couldn't bear it. Uh, but he loved the plays and he was always drawn to the fact that the plays have an energy that's very modern. Yes, Edmund. Um, I was just wondering, the, the version of Master Olaf that I read preparing for this yeah. wasn't, wasn't Michael May. I, I read the only one I could get hold of. And yes. the, 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 the translator, the man writing the introduction suggested that he wrote several different versions, one of which, one of which was, ver was verse and then <laughs> another one was verse and then it changed. I no, well, first of all, he wrote a prose version and then they told him to go away and write it in, in poetry. So he rewrote it completely in poetry. And that was the version that was performed that was a success. Mm. But he always felt that the original was the best one was that was the prose one. Um, and so uh, and that's the extraordinary thing is, yes, that was that was his problem. Every single time he wrote a play that broke new ground, it was rejected. So he was trying to create a kind of revolution in the theatre. He also, interestingly, invented studio theatre. He was the first one to create small-scale theatre. We'll get onto that in a bit. Uh, and that didn't work for him either. So um, in every way, he was someone who set everything up for us, uh, but all the way through his life, um, uh, everyone just said no. Uh, but he, and that, what was, I always find his problem is he never gave up. He just carried on batting his head against the wall. So um, anyway, beautifully read, Edmund. Thank you for that. So the key thing for Strindberg um, uh, was his first marriage. Um, and his early, he was famous when he was youngest for writing a novel called The Red Room, uh, or a series of, of short stories, which, which ended up with a blasphemy trial. Uh, this, and this, these books uh, caused a sensation all across uh, Sweden. Um, and he was forced to stand up and give testimony because his, his publisher, Brandes, who was Jewish, um, Brandes also published in Ib Sibson, and he was one of these extraordinary men who, who supported all these forward-thinking playwrights and, and writers. Um, and uh, because he was Jewish, he knew that if they were going to be put on trial for, for blasphemy, uh, he would be absolutely roasted. So he persuaded Strindberg to take, to take the um, uh, stand instead of him. And Strindberg was, uh, uh, came out of it quite badly. Uh, and from then onwards, hated Jews, which is, which is great. Fantastic. Well done. So, um, but... Uh, this book was the one that absolutely made his name. Uh, now, the, the key thing for him, he was, uh, was, and he was seen as a radical and the young people liked his work, but the key thing for him was his first marriage to a woman called Siri von Essen. And Siri was, uh, he had several children with her. What was complex about this was that Siri was already married when, when he met her. He, she, he, was, he was married to a Baron Wrangel von Essen. Uh, and he and she fell in love. They had a kind of clandestine affair. And it turns out that probably Vangel knew about it, her husband knew about it, and he was happily having affairs elsewhere. Uh, eventually, Siri went off with Strindberg, and the marriage was dissolved, and Strindberg married Siri. Uh, but the key there was there was this huge class disparity, uh, which feeds into Miss Julie. And to begin with, the two of them were very happy. Uh, Siri Manesson wanted to be uh, an actress, uh, and she'd already had some success on stage. And for the first eight or nine years of their marriage with children, they were blissfully happy. They all, that's the, everyone talks about the fact that it was a wonderful marriage. And then it explosively fell apart. Um, and uh, it was supposedly triggered by um, the appearance of a lodger, a woman called Maria, uh, who Strindberg eventually accused Siri of having an affair with. Uh, and gradually the, the marriage just ripped itself apart. Um, and it became, having been this wonderful, happy marriage, became absolutely tormented. At a key moment, um, uh, Siri tried to prove that Strindberg was mad, and at another point tried to prove to him that his children weren't his own children, which didn't help his mental health at all. Uh, he also retaliated with his own awfulness, uh, and it became this absolutely horrendous split which shattered him, uh, and wasn't that much fun for her either. Um, but throughout this strange period when they were breaking up, uh, they kept on 
as classically people splitting up do, splitting up and then coming back together again and splitting up and then coming back together again. Uh, and because she wanted to be an actress, he carried on writing plays for her. And the key play that he wrote for her was Miss Julie. Now this is the really big uh, revelation of a play. Um, this was the play, it's the first play, as I said earlier, Working Class Hero. It's set in a kitchen in an aristocrat's um, uh, building. No one, when the curtain first came up on this, on this performance, this is after it had been banned on its first appearance, um, everyone was absolutely stunned not to see a, a kind of um, elegant and amazing set, but something completely naturalistic. And the thing that upset them the most was the fact that, that there was mud on the boots of the Lord. At the very opening sequence, Mitch John comes in, who's the main, who's the, the valet for the Lord with his, uh, the Lord's boots and they had mud on them. And this apparently caused a furore. Everyone was horrified. It was just ugly, it was disgusting, it was just awful. Uh, but people underestimate just what a massive breakthrough this play was. It's about a relationship or a, or a sexual encounter between an aristocratic young woman, Miss Julie, uh, and valet. Now at that time, um, uh, such things were, they were scandalous, but they were essentially unheard of. And you certainly didn't turn them into a play. Uh, but what Strindberg does, which, which spins it, is he makes John, who is the valet, um, quite a powerful figure. Uh, Miss Julie, uh, this all takes place on a midsummer, midsummer, midsummer Eve, which I think is, did you say it was tonight, Alice? Uh, next week, okay, so next, <laughs> Midsummer is, 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 and it's a celebration is going on in the, in, in, in the, in the castle where um, the, the Lord has, uh, is away. Uh, the lady is dead, so Miss Julie's mother is dead. And the Lord has gone away. So Miss Julie is left in the building with the servants and she decides she's going to gate crash the servants party. So everybody in the, in the, in the, in the, in the she's alone there with all these servants who are singing and dancing. And at the beginning of the play, she comes down into the kitchen where John is, um, who doesn't see himself as being as um, uh, plebeian as the other servants, uh, is talking to his fiance, Christine, who's the head uh, of the kitchen. And Miss Julie comes in, and the only way you can describe it is she plays a massive, she makes a massive play for John. Jean, she uh, flirts with him effectively, uh, all but throws her clothes off and jumps on him. <laughs> uh, and throughout the scene, there's this extraordinary toing and froing between the two of them. Uh, and she's very flamboyant and charismatic and full of energy. Uh, and he, throughout that section, appears to resist um, everything that she's doing. But at the same time, all the way through this cat and mouse, sexual cat and mouse scene, they're dropping hints to each other about, okay, how far are you willing to go? How far are you willing to go? Uh, and what's brilliant about it is, is, A, when you watch it, it's extraordinarily modern. Secondly, what Strindberg does underneath it all, the, the, the suggestivity, which we talked about in Ibsen, is, is even further, uh, more kind of incisive. But the brilliance of it is that, is that what works in the play is that um, with all the other plays that he wrote, the battle is between a man and a woman. But in this one, it's spun with class. Um, uh, and I never used to like Miss Julie. I always used to think it was the least interesting of them all until I did it a few years ago. And I realized that the genius of it is the, the way that he places class on this relationship between a man and a woman. So instead of it being an ordinary sexual encounter, it's a sexual encounter which, which breaks all the taboos. The other thing about it is that they're both oppressed. So you can argue with other Strindberg plays that the misogyny is, is just misogyny. Uh, but with this one, uh, although Miss Julie is in some sense as a woman oppressed, so is John because of the class issue. So the tension between them, it equalizes the two of them. Uh, and there's a brilliant speech at the beginning <coughs> where um, uh, John and Miss Julie are talking to each other and John tells her a story which, which when you listen to it at the time um, is an insight into the working class world of the time which nobody had seen on the stage before. Let's have the scene. Have you ever been in love? We don't use that word. But I've been fond of a lot of girls. And once I was sick because I couldn't get the one I wanted. Yes, sick, do you hear? Like those princes in the Arabian Nights who couldn't eat or sleep because of love. Who was she? Who was she? You cannot order me to answer that. If I ask you as an equal, as a friend, who was she? You. 
<laughs> How absurd. <laughs> yes, if you like, it was absurd. Look, this was the story I didn't want to tell you just now, but now I will tell you. Do you know how the world looks from down there? No, you don't. Like hawks and eagles whose backs one seldom sees, because most of the time they hover above you. I live in a hut with seven brothers and sisters and a pig, out in the grey fields where never a tree grew. But from the window I could see the wall of his lordship's park with apple trees rising above it. It was the garden of paradise. And there stood many evil angels with flaming swords to guard it. But despite them, I and other boys found a way into the tree of life. You despise me now. Oh, I suppose all boys steal apples. Hmm. You can say that now, but you do despise me. However, one day I entered the garden with my mother to weed the onion beds. On one side of the garden stood a Turkish pavilion in the shadow of jasmine trees and overgrown with honeysuckle. I'd never seen such a building. I wondered what it could be for. People went in and came out again. And one day the door was left open. I crept in, saw the walls hung with pictures of mm -hmm. emperors, and there were red velvet curtains on the windows with tassels. Ah, now you understand. It was the lavatory. I, I'd never been inside the palace, never seen anything except the church, but this was more beautiful. And however my thoughts might stray, they always returned there. And gradually I began to long just once to experience the full ecstasy of actually. Enfin, I tiptoed inside, saw and marveled. But then, someone's coming. There was only one exit for the lords and the ladies, but for me, there was another. And I had no choice but to take it. And I ran, broke through a raspberry hedge, charged across a strawberry patch. I'd found myself on a terrace with a rose garden. There I saw a pink dress and a pair of white stockings. You. I hid under a pile of weeds. Under. Can you imagine that? Under thistles that pricked me, and wet earth that stank like me. And I looked at you as you walked among the roses, and I thought, if it is true that a thief can enter heaven and dwell with the angels, then it's strange that a peasant's child here on earth cannot enter the great park and play with the Lord's daughter. Do you suppose all poor children have the same ideas as you? Of all poor. Yes, of course, of course. Oh, it must be a terrible misfortune to be poor. Oh, Miss Dooley. Oh, oh. A dog may lie on the Countess's sofa. A horse may have its nose patted by a young lady's hand, but a servant. Oh. Now and then man has strength enough to hoist himself up in the world, but how often does it happen? But do you know what I did? I ran down into the mill stream with my clothes on. They dragged me out and beat me. But the following Sunday, when my father and all the others had gone to visit my grandmother, I managed to fix things so that I stayed at home. And then I scrubbed myself with soap and hot water put on my best clothes and went to church in order that I might see you. I saw you. And I returned home determined to die. But I wanted to die beautifully and pleasantly without pain. Then I remembered it was dangerous to sleep under an elder bush. We had a big one in flower. I stripped it of everything it held and then I lay down in the oat bin. 
Have, we ever, have you ever noticed how beautiful oats are? Soft to the touch like human skin. Well, I shut the lid and closed my eyes. I fell asleep and woke up feeling really very ill. But I didn't die, as you can see. What did I want? I don't know. I had no hope of winning you, of course. But you were a symbol to me of the hopelessness of my ever climbing out of the class in which I was born. Good, thank you very much. It's an amazing, it's an amazing speech. Um, when, when, we, when we did the play, we talked about it, we described it as over Downton Abbey with the gloves off. Um, and uh, what's, 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 what, what, what it's hard to credit is that that speech, which deals so powerfully with sexuality and class, nothing like that had been on the stage before. Uh, it's, you get close to it in something like Henry V, in the scene between Henry V and the soldiers before Agincourt, but nothing as overt as that. And it was a window onto the, onto, the, onto the world outside the gentry and the wealthy that Strimbo put on stage for the first time. You can see there that there's a huge amount of himself in that. Uh, mm. Siri, like Miss Julie, was also an aristocrat. And there was an awful lot of, of Siri in what he wrote um, uh, Miss Julie as being. Uh, so what happens in, in the play there is, of course, Miss Julie at this point thinks that her class protects her. She's able to flirt with him and, and apparently seduce him. And it all goes badly wrong when the other servants come crashing into the kitchen. And they're pretty convinced that Miss Julie and he are having an affair. So they come in to try and find them uh, and they escape into uh, John's bedroom. And unfortunately, while the uh, servants are ransacking it, they do actually have sex. Uh, you have to kind of work out what happened, but the way he certainly describes it, she jumps on him. Uh, that's the inference. So the whole second half of the play is about them coming to terms with what they've actually done. They've been massively sexually attracted to each other. And it's clear from what he says that he's been attracted to her for years. And all the other servants know there's sexual tension between them. But once they've actually had sex, the bubble completely bursts. And because the rest of the servants know what's going on, it's absolutely clear that, there's, that they're, they're trapped in a completely scandalous situation. Uh, and for the rest of that night, it's about them trying to work out what to do, everything just coming apart. But what's astonishing about it is that once he has made love to her, or had, they don't really make love, they've had sex, um, uh, he sees himself as more powerful than her. He suddenly sees it. He's, he's now no longer below her, he's above her. So there's this massive uh, overturning of the relationship between them. And at the height of it, they absolutely rip each other apart. And the scene we're about to see is them ripping each other apart. And you'll see why Strindberg was seen so shocking um, uh, and why his frankness is still so modern. Take it away, guys. Where did you get that wine from? The cellar. My father's burgundy. Is it too good for his son-in-law? And I drink beer. I. That only proves you have an inferior palate to mine. Thief. What a devil. Oh, accomplice to a sneak thief. Was I drunk? Was I dreaming? Midsummer's night, the night of innocent happiness. Innocent? <laughs> Is there anyone on this earth as miserable as I? Why should you be miserable after such a conquest? Think of Christine in there. Don't you suppose she has feelings too? I thought so just now, but I don't any longer. Servants are servants. And whores are whores. Oh, God. In heaven end my miserable life. Save me from this mire into which I am sinking. Save me. I can't deny I feel sorry for you. When I lay in the onion bed and saw you in the rose garden, I might as well tell you now, I had the same dirty thoughts as any small boy. You, who wanted to die for me? No, ought been. No, oh, that was just talk. A lie? More or less. I once read a story in a paper about a sweep who curled up in a wood chest with some lilacs because he'd had a paternity you would have brought against him. I see. You're the kind who... Well, I had to think up something. Women always fall for pretty stories. Swine! Merd! And now you've managed to see the eagle's back. Not exactly its back. And I was to be the first branch. But the branch was rotten. 
I was to be the signboard of the hotel. And I, the hotel. I was to sit at your desk, attract your customers, fiddle your bills. No, I'd have done that. Can a human soul become so foul? Wash it then. Servant, lucky, stand up when I speak. Servant's whore, lucky's bitch. Shut your mouth and get out of here. You dare to stand there and call me foul. Not one of my class ever behaved the way you've done tonight. Do you think any kitchen maid would accost a man like you did? Have you ever seen any girl of my class offer her body like that? I've only seen it among animals and prostitutes. Good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. That, as you can see, it's brutal stuff. Um, oh. And um, uh, that's what I mean by the fact that Strindberg went even further than Ibsen. There's a kind of gentlemanliness to Ibsen, but Strindberg just goes all the way out to this kind of awful emotional carnage. Um, but the brilliance of it is all the way through this second act. Um, the play is constantly tipping over. One minute he's vile, then she's vile, then you care about her, then you care about him. And there are moments in it where, where there's a truce between them, where there's compassion. There's a brilliant sequence where suddenly out of nowhere, he apologizes to her and says, look, I'm really sorry. You, all you, this is just a one night stand, it's just a one off thing. You, you, I'm, you know, you're much too, too good for me. And the deeper they get into this kind of mess, the more they end up in the mire. Um, uh, she drinks heavily, you reveal, you find out about her past and the kind of emotional abuse that she's put up with from her, fan, from her family, uh, the way she was brought up. Um, and what Strindberg's doing is just bringing down the whole edifice of the idea of an aristocracy. But what's brilliant about it is, is, is uh, what, what's interesting about it is that when you read what he writes about it, he's vicious about Miss Julie. And for many years, everyone just thought it was a horrible character assassination um, towards his, 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 his wife. Uh, and so much of it is based on his wife, uh, who also used to drink heavily and all these different things. But the, but, the, but the potency is that actually he was a better playwright than he was a man. He, he sees um, John, he describes John as a kind of heroic aristocratic figure who will create a dynasty. Uh, and he talks about, okay, the inevitable tragedy of an of a aristocratic woman being thrown down. But by the end of the play, you've got to know Miss Julie so powerfully uh, that she, she transcends what Strindberg may have thought he was trying to do and she becomes a truly tragic heroine. You recognise that at the end of the play she is someone whose innocence has been destroyed, um, whose, whose upbringing has brutalised her uh, and she also exists at a time when all sorts of the women's rights that now exist now don't exist. So now a one night stand isn't going to end up with someone killing themselves. Uh, then it wasn't quite as simple as that. And this is one of the reasons when we did it, this is something, I, one of my big crusades about Strindberg, and I sometimes get into trouble with it, with the critics, is, uh, although we didn't with Miss Julie, interestingly, is I don't like updating them. And there's been a lot of, particularly with Miss Julie, versions of it, which set it at different other periods. So for instance, there's one the famous after Miss Julie sets it, uh, after Clem, in, uh, just in 1940, whenever it was, 45, the first Labour, the big Labour Party landslide. There's another one which sets it during the general strike. And the problem for me uh, with doing that is you create uh, a situation where there's a social movement which is going to support one of the characters. So uh, John in, in um, 1945, the first Labour government, the political movement is changing his, his existence. The same thing in the general strike. But the point with Miss Julie and John is they don't have anything like that. There is no safety net for them. There is no social movement that's at the time that was strong enough to, to transfer. Um, uh, Rachel's just asked, when was you writing? It was in the late 1800s. Um, so uh, it's a harsher world that Miss Julie and John exist in. Uh, and the power and the extraordinary thing about what Strindberg does is that Miss Julie is actually a very modern woman. That what, 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 what Julie's trying to do is live as a modern woman would now with the freedoms that you have now but she's destroyed by the society that she actually lives in which doesn't give her that opportunity and one of the extraordinary things about um, uh, John's character is if he's meant to be a dynastic hero he ends up completely beaten at the end uh, and the final scene um, they come up with all these weird plots as to how they're going to escape they're going to set up a hotel somewhere it's all going to be fine but the, it's all slammed shut when Christine finds out what's going and blackmails them and also locks them in, makes sure that they can't actually escape. And the final scene, which is the death scene where Miss Julie faces her end, uh, you see there's this strange, after all the brutality between them, strange kinship between them. Let's have that scene. Now I will actually say, I'm gonna to have to read out, the key thing here is it all takes place down in the kitchen. 
uh, and we are aware of the Lord um, upstairs. He arrives, <coughs> he's been away and he comes back. So they know that quite soon that he's going to find out what's going on. And the key thing there is that there is a the servant's bell which rings. So I'm going to have to read out when the bell rings because it's quite crucial. Okay, off you go, guys. Have you never loved your father, Miss Dewey? Yes, enormously. But I've hated him too. I must have done so without realising. But it was he who brought me up to despise my own sex, made me half woman and half man. Who is to blame for what has happened? My father? My mother? Myself? Myself. I have no self. I haven't a thought I didn't get from my father, not an emotion I didn't get from my mother. And this last idea that all people are equal, I got that from him, my fiance, whom I called a wretched little fool because of it. How can the blame be mine then? Put it all on to Jesus, as Christine did. No, I'm too proud to do that, and too clever, thanks to my learned father. And all that about a rich person not being able to get into heaven, that's a lie. And Christine has money in the savings bank, so she won't get there either. Whose fault is it all? What does it matter whose fault it is? I shall have to bear the blame carry the consequences. Yes, but the bell rings. His lordship's home. Good God, do you suppose Christine? He goes to the speaking tube. Has he been to his desk? It's John, my lord. Yes, my lord. Yes, my lord. Immediately. At once, my lord. Very good, my lord, in half an hour. What does he say? I forgot to say, what does he say? He wants his boots and his coffee in half an hour. In half an hour, then? Oh, I'm so tired. I can't feel anything. I can't repent. Can't run away, can't stay, can't live, can't die. Help me. Order me and I'll obey you like a dog. Do me this last service. Save my honour, save his name. You know what I ought to will myself to do, but I can't. Will me too, John. Order me. I don't know. Now I can't either. I don't understand. It's just as though this court made me. I can't order you. And now, since his lordship spoke to me, I, I can't explain it properly, but oh, it's this damned lackey that sits on my back. I think if his lordship came down now and ordered me to cut my throat, I'd do it on the spot. Then pretend that you are he and I am you. You acted so well just now, but when you went down on your knees, then you were an aristocrat. Or haven't you ever been to the theater and seen a hypnotist? He says to his subject, take the broom, and he takes it. He says, sweep, and he sweeps. But the subject has to be asleep. I am already asleep. The whole room is like smoke around me. And you look like an iron stove, which resembles a man dressed in black with a tall hat. And your eyes shine like coals when the fire is dying. And your face is, is a white smear like ash. And it's so warm and good and so bright and so peaceful. John picks up the razor and places it in her hand. Is the broom. Go now, while it's light. 
Actually, I'm, I'm in the middle of a workshop. Can I ring you back? It finishes about... Carry on. Go now, while it's light. Out to the barn and... Thank you. Now I'm going to rest. But just tell me this. Those who are first, they too can receive grace. Say it to me, even if you don't believe it. Those who are first? No, I can't. But wait, Miss Julie, now I see it. You are no longer among the first. You are among the last. That's true. I am among the last of all. I am the last. Oh, but now I can't go. Tell me once more, say I must go. No, now I can't either, I can't. And the first shall be last. Don't think, don't think. You take all my strength from me. You make me a coward. What? I thought the bell moved. No. Shall we stuff paper in it? To be so afraid of a bell. Yes, but it isn't only a bell. There's someone behind it, sitting behind it. A hand sets it in motion and something else sets the hand in motion. And you've only got to close your ears. Close your ears. Yes, but now he's ringing louder. He'll ring till someone answers and then it'll be too late. The police will come and then... The bell rings again. It's horrible. But it's the only possible ending. Go. Miss Julie walks firmly out through the door. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, as you can see, yeah. <laughs> You can see the intensity of it, yeah? You can see the absolute intensity of it and the darkness of it. And it's, it's, it's the brilliance of it. It all takes place in real time. It all takes place in this, at night um, after drinking and all those different things. And it's long left behind the kind of um, uh, conventional world that Ibsen's characters are able to, to survive in, uh, which is not to say that Ibsen is a bad player, right? Far from it. But Strindberg goes into, into those dark territories that, that he doesn't. Um, you see also there how both of them are trapped do you see what I mean? That, 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 that at the end of the play, they're both reduced to nothing. Um, she goes off and kills herself and he's reduced right back to being this um, uh, slave, as it were. And that was Strindberg's genius. The, the play, it does end up being this astonishing kind of um, uh, tragedy of, 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 of men and women being trapped by class, by gender and all those different things. So uh, somehow, um, if he was a misogynist at that point, uh, he transcended it in some sense. Um, and the language is very modern. You can see how powerful Michael's translation of it is. Uh, and the detail. The other really interesting thing about that last section is he was an atheist at the time, but the thing that enables her to die is the notion that she will have grace because she's now the last. Uh, and whether he was an atheist or not, she needs to believe that to go through that. And this takes us back to Master Olaf. There's a spirituality in Strindberg that he never quite lost, which came back to him towards the end of his life. But Miss Julie was this enormous uh, explosion of a play. As I say, it was banned when it first came out. He tried to open it um, and it was, it was closed down on the, um, the dress rehearsal that it was supposed to open in Denmark, in Christiana, I think it was. Uh, and he'd founded a thing called the Intimate, uh, no, not the Intimate Theatre, hadn't quite got there. He'd, he'd, he'd created his own playhouse because he had no money. Uh, he invented what you call the studio fringe venue. Uh, tiny little theatres um, and he wants to get rid he wrote an amazing preface where he talks about all the things he wants to get rid of he wants to get rid of um, uh, the, the, the over, overdone makeup fake settings the whole lot he wants a realism on stage and he was very inspired in that sense by Zola um, uh, but it was banned because um, it was seen as being immoral uh, because a servant and a, and a lady had sex on stage. So it was absolutely bad. The only way he could then get it on was to present it as a, as a special private viewing. But even then, although it was no one knew what was happening, it was the, the rejection of it was intense. Some critics recognised something interesting was happening, but it was just too much for them. Uh, and when you consider that, that, that it took, what? This is in, the I think, the 1860s or 70s, 
it took almost 100 years for us to write Look Back in Anger, which was the first play which also dealt with class and relationships in England. It took us a long time to do this. It took D.H. Lawrence to write his novels uh, in, in the early 20th century. We just didn't deal with this on stage. Um, Sean O'Casey was the first to write great working class characters. It came to us late, uh, but Strindberg was doing it long before anybody else had done it. So Miss Julie was, um, uh, the other interesting thing about Miss Julie is it's 90 minutes long. And this was something, and it's only one act. And this was yet another innovation that Strindberg brought up, um, as well as creating what he wanted, this small intimate space with only about 100 people watching a show. Because he didn't have any money, uh, he set all these plays to be done with only like a few tables and chairs. They were meant to be cheap to put on. So they're actually ideal for productions now, if you're putting things on on the fringe. Um, uh, but um, this thing of, of a play being 90 minutes long, again, no one had really done that before, not with tragedy. Tragedies always had to be four hours long or two hours long. Strip Ebsen's plays are all three acts, four acts, five acts. Strindberg decided he wasn't going to do that. He didn't want to have an interval. He didn't want audiences coming out of one of his plays and going, are you enjoying it? And completely displaying the spell and then going back in. He wanted to grip you and hold you for 90 minutes and then say you can go. Uh, and he was really proud of that achievement. He talked to, he said, all these plays, there's enough meat on these for like four hours, a whole evening, but I've distilled it down to 90. And he just, he, he compared it to boiling a, a brisket that, that once you've actually um, boiled the meat, it all gets shrivels up and you've just got pure, pure taste. So that was a yet another innovation that he created. And most of his plays are only 90 minutes long. Um, uh, and, and all of them are very intense in that respect. So Miss Julie was part of three plays, which weren't really a trilogy, but they were the three big naturalistic plays that he wrote, uh, which were about these psychosexual wars between men and women and relationships going bad. The other one, the other one, the first strip I ever did was is Creditors, which we're not going to look at here, which is a brilliant three-hander, uh, which in some sense was a memory of his own, uh, uh, how he rap he took someone else's wife, he took this, Duke, this man's wife, but he was also writing it when his wife was leaving him. And this is about a strange love triangle between uh, a woman in her late 30s, early 40s, who's married to a young man who's only in his late 20s, who's a, paint, a sculptor, and then his, her former husband, who comes in to destroy the marriage uh, and inveigles himself into the young man's life and convinces him that his, his, his wife is, is being unfaithful. And it's an amazing 90 minute, super intense play about this love triangle. Uh, and the genius of it is that you never see all three characters on stage until right at the end. It's three brilliant duologues where they try, where they come back to each other. And at the end of it, astonishingly, um, uh, the last line is she really loves him, uh, poor Tecla that actually underneath all the cruelty in the play, there is a deep love that the characters have got. Uh, and yet again, what Strindberg does is, is place in the young character, his younger self, who believed in love and women and, and art, and then his older self, who was cynical and angry. Uh, but it's a stunning play, absolutely brilliant. It's not done as much as Miss Julie, but in many ways, it's an even better play. But the other play, which he was notorious for, is a play called The Father, which was his response to, the, to a doll's house. And this uh, is an incredibly dark play, and I've never quite had the courage to do it. I've always admired it. I remember reading it at the age of 16 and kind of going like this. And I remember when, we, when I studied at Mountview, which is where I met Danny and Alice, one of the actors said, I felt like I'd been beaten up when I <laughs> read it. And the play is about uh, a marriage, but at the beginning of the play, it's already not in a very good place. It's a captain and his wife, Laura, and they have a single child, Bertha. And the captain is um, uh, an atheist and a free thinker and he's interested in science. Um, and his wife wants, and they're having a war over how Bertha is going to be, Bertha is going to be brought up. Will she, brought up. will she be brought up with Laura's family who are religious or will he send her away uh, to live with a free thinking family and, and learn a trade? And at a key moment, uh, in, as they're arguing, the husband and Captain and Laura, he lets slip that ultimately, because he's the man, he has the, he has the decision about how the child is going to be uh, educated. Uh, uh, and that the only way that, that, his, um, that Laura can, could, could ever have power over the child was if she could prove the child wasn't his. At which point she said, well, she isn't. And that is the tool that she uses against him. She tells him, makes him believe the child is not his own. And the process sends him over the edge uh, and he becomes insane. Uh, he literally, what's astonishing about the play is you see this man's mind unravel. Uh, and it, and um, because ultimately, once she's planted the seed of, of this idea that Bell's not his, even if she denies it from then onwards, he can't know for sure. 
Uh, and as a consequence, this man, who at the beginning of the play is, is quite misogynistic and cruel, just falls apart. Um, and it is like, um, it's like watching someone turn into the Incredible Hulk. There's a very famous story that Michael Mayer told about uh, a production of it in the 1950s, I think, with, with an actor called Wilfred Lawson playing the father, Captain. And the story, the, the, the last act begins, the father has locked himself in his study and he's reading every book he can find about paternity. And he finds references in Homer and all sorts of other playwrights about how no man can ever truly know that their children are his. Uh, and at the beginning of the scene, everybody else is gathered outside the door uh, and the father flings, they can hear him stomping around. He flings open the door and he comes out and he starts ranting. And it, apparently when Michael Mayer saw it, I think this was the press night, the door got jammed and Wilfred Lawson couldn't get through the door. But instead of going, all right, stop the play, can someone open the door? He punched his way through the door. This actor smacked his way through the door. So you saw a fist come through the door with kind of bits of the set in the fist, bleeding, opening the door, swinging it open and coming out. And Michael always said that that was one of the most electrifying pieces of acting he'd ever seen. But that's very much the intensity of the play. So the scene we're going to see, and this was, as I say, very much based on what, what Strindberg had gone through. Uh, now, there's a very interesting thing, just a tiny little detour here, is that, is that Strindberg um, didn't write plays like anybody else you can imagine. Ibsen took three years to reach each play he wrote, and he wrote three drafts. He spent time thinking about it, writing notes, he'd write a draft, then he'd write again, and he'd keep developing until he felt he knew his characters intimately. Strindberg didn't put his pen to paper until he'd worked out every single line of his play in his head. So he had the whole play in his head. He would then sit down and he would get a pad of paper and he would just write almost like automatic writing. And he would finish a page and he would push the page off the, off, off the table and it would fall on the floor. So he would write, push, so by the end of the play, uh, there was this script just lying on the floor um, uh, in a mess. And Siri would then come in, work out the order of the plays, <laughs> put them all together, uh, go like that, put them in an envelope, and then send them off to, to theatres. And one of the things that's astonishing is that, is that Strindberg never, he never revised his plays. He did say to people, um, you can cut them if you want, but don't, he never, but he also never read them after he'd written them. So he wrote, he wrote the plays, having thought about them for six months, sent them off, and then waited to hear what people said. Um, and most of them said, not doing this, this is insane. But there was a theatre in Paris which did it, the Théâtre Livre, which was the big um, um, revolutionary theatre at the time, which became the model for the royal court in England. But there's a wonderful story that when Strindberg eventually then saw, read The Father, having had it accepted, he was horrified by it. Because <laughs> he'd written it and then forgotten what he'd written. So when he read it, it, the intensity of it absolutely shocked him. But it was a time of his life where he was in an absolute state of mental horror. Uh, and he described it once to somebody that, that when it, I wrote the play in such darkness that if someone had opened the window and let the light in, it would have destroyed me. So it's a very, very, very dark play. The question in the play is you never know whether the wife is scheming from the beginning or whether she's an opportunist that it's a battle that she's fighting with him uh, and actually Strindberg is clever enough to show right at the beginning how the wife is totally disenfranchised in the marriage but the key scene is in the middle uh, and this scene is written almost we, we looked at the scene at the end of a doll's house last the other week when we did the Ibsen where Nora sits Torvald down and explains why she's leaving him this scene is written almost as a, not a parody of it, but an absolute reply to it, because it almost starts even with the same reference, uh, the same sentence. And this scene is happening in the middle of it, where, where, the, where the father is starting to lose control of his sanity. And he sat with the doctor and he started to explain what's that making him anxious about how men can never know what the, their children are, and women can't be trusted sexually. And the doctor starts getting freaked out and says, okay, no more of this, this, this is freaking me out a bit. Um, but I'm not gonna, I don't think you're mad. Uh, but I'm not going to do anything about this. And at the end of the scene, the doctor goes out and the captain walks over to the door and he opens the door and his wife is waiting outside. And he says, I could hear you listening. Come on in and let's talk. And this is the scene that happens between them. It's late. But we must talk this matter out. Sit down. This evening, I went to the post office and collected my letters. It is evident from them that you have been intercepting both my outgoing and my incoming correspondence. The resultant waste of time has virtually destroyed the value of my researches. I was acting from kindness. You were neglecting your duties for this work. You were not acting from kindness. 
You feared that someday I might win more honor through these researches than through my military career, and you were determined that I should not win any honor, because that would throw into relief your insignificance. Now I have confiscated some letters addressed to you. How noble of you. I am glad you appreciate my qualities. It is clear from these letters that for some time you have been turning all my former friends against me for spreading a rumor concerning my sanity. And you've succeeded. For now, hardly one of them, from my commanding officer to my cook, regards me as sane. The situation regarding my mental condition is as follows. My brain is, as you know, unaffected since I can perform both my professional duties and my duties as a father. I still have my emotions more or less under control, and my will is, to date, fairly unimpaired. But you have been chipping and chafing at it so that soon the cogs will disengage and the wheels will start whirling backwards. I shall not appeal to your feelings, for you have none. That is your strength, but I appeal to your self-interest. Go on. By your behaviour, you have succeeded in filling my mind with doubt, so that soon my judgment will be clouded and my thoughts begin to wander. This is the approaching dementia for which you have been waiting and which may come at any time. Now you must ask yourself the question, is it not more to your interest that I should be well rather than ill? Think heaven. If I break down, I shall lose my job, and you will be without support. If I die, you will receive the insurance on my life. But if I kill myself, you will get nothing. So it is to your own interest that I should go on living. Is this a trap? Yes. It is up to you whether you go round it or stick your neck in it. You say you'll kill yourself. You won't. Are you sure? Do you think a man can live when he has nothing and no one to live for? Then you capitulate? No. I propose an armistice. And your conditions? That I retain my sanity, free from my doubts, and I will abandon the battle. What doubts? About Bertha's parentage. Are there any doubts about that? In my mind there are. You have awoken them. I? Yes. You have dripped them into my ear like poison, and events have fostered the, their growth. Free me from my uncertainty. Tell me straight out, it is so. And already I forgive you. How can I confess to a crime I have not committed? What does it matter? You know I shan't reveal it. Do you think a man goes around trumpeting his shame? If I say it isn't true, you won't be sure. But if I say it is, you will be. So you would rather it was true? Yes. It's strange, but I suppose it's because the one cannot be proved, whereas the other can. Have you any grounds for your suspicions? Yes, I know. I suppose you'd like me to be guilty, so that you could throw me out and keep the child to yourself. But you won't catch me with a trick like that. Do you think I'd want to keep some other man's child if I knew you were guilty? I'm sure you wouldn't. And that's why I realised you were lying just now, when you said you already forgave me. Laura, save me and my sanity. Do you understand what I'm saying? If the child is not mine, I have no rights over her and want none. And, and that is all that you want, isn't it? Or do you want something else too? Do you want to retain your power over the child, but to keep me here as the breadwinner? Power? Yes. What has this life and death struggle been for, if not for power? I do not believe in resurrection, and to me this child was my life. Hereafter, she was my idea of immortality. Perhaps the only one that has any roots in reality. Take her away and you cut short my life. Why didn't we part while there was still time? Because the child bound us together. 
but the bond became a chain. How did it become that? How? I've never thought about it, but now memories return, accusing, condemning. We had been married for two years and had no children. You best know why. I fell ill and lay near to death. In a lucid moment, I hear voices from the drawing room. It is you and the lawyer talking about my money. I still had some then. He is explaining that you cannot inherit anything because we have no children. And he asks if you are pregnant. I didn't hear your reply. I got better and we had a child. Who is the father? You. No, it is not I. A crime lies buried here and it's beginning to come to light. And what a hellish crime. You women were soft hearted enough to free your black slaves, but you keep your white ones. I have worked and slaved for you, for your child, your mother, your servants. I have sacrificed my life and my career. I have undergone torture, scourging, sleeplessness, every kind of torment for you. My hair has turned gray. All that's also that you might live free from care and when you grow old enjoy new life through your child all this i have borne without complaint because i believed i was the father to this child this is the most arrant form of theft the most brutal slavery i have served 17 years of hard labor for a crime I did not commit. What can you give me in return? Now you really are mad. <laughs> so you hope. And I have seen how you work to hide your crime. I pitied you because I didn't understand why you were sad. I often calmed your evil conscience, supposing that I was driving away some sick thought. I heard you cry aloud in your sleep, though I didn't want to listen. The night before last, it was Bertha's birthday. It was between two and three o'clock in the morning and I was sitting up, reading. You screamed as though someone was trying to strangle you. Don't come, don't come! I banged on the wall because, because I didn't want to hear any more. I have had my suspicions for a long time, but I didn't care. I didn't dare to hear them confirmed. I have suffered all this for you. What will you do for me? What can I do? I will swear by God and all that is sacred that you are Bertha's father. What good will that do? When you have already said that a mother should commit any crime for the sake of her child. I implore you, by the memory of the past, I beg you, as a wounded man begs for mercy, tell me everything. Don't you see that I am as helpless as a child? Can't you hear me crying for pity like a child crying to his mother? Can't you forget that I am a man, a soldier, who with a word can tame men and beasts? I ask only for the pity that you would extend to a sick man. I lay down my power and cry for mercy for my life. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Yeah, OK, wow. <laughs> All right, so there's not much um, subtext there, not like Ibsen. It's absolutely on the nose. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, even that short, brilliantly read, you can see why it's such a, still a controversial play. It's very, very dark, huge pain. It was quite, quite a shock to hear that line about slavery as well, which I think everybody um, probably had a bit of a shiver when that, <laughs> when that came up. Um, but uh, the, what I've always found amazing about this scene is whenever I've done workshops on Ibsen and Strindberg, uh, and I've, asked, I've looked at this scene and I've looked at the Nora scene. Everyone is much more compelled by this scene because the man is in a vulnerable space. Do you know what I mean? That actually he's not strong. He's trying to be strong. Uh, and you're seeing the roots of that. Of, of what, this is why he was accused of misogyny was because of the darkness that, 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 that's vomiting up. 
but the pain of it comes from uh literal experience of what of what went, what he went through now what's really interesting about this scene it's a, it's a very interesting thing for a misogynist the women that he created were always stronger than the men um the, absolutely uh, laura laura destroys defeats the captain and actually the captain defeats himself that actually a lot of a lot of the madness is something that's latent in him that, that rips himself apart but what's fascinating in this scene is that moments later he starts to break down and then suddenly what seems to be a battle between them shifts into something where it's no longer a battle and there's this strange strange intimate scene can you play the scene please at this point she's actually uh hugging him or he's lying with her lap what Man, you're crying. Yes, I am crying. Although I am a man. But has not a man eyes? Has not a man hands, limbs, heart, thoughts, passions? Does he not live by the same food? Is he not wounded by the same weapons? Warmed and cooled by the same summer and winter as a woman? If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? Why should a man be, forbid be forbidden to complain or a soldier to weep? Because it is unmanly. Why is it unmanly? Weep, my child. Your mother is here to comfort you. Do you remember? It was as your second mother that I first entered into your life. Your big, strong body was afraid. You were a great child who had come too late into the world, or had come unwanted. Yes, I suppose I was that. Father and mother had me against their will, and so I was born without a will. When you and I became one, I thought I was making myself whole. So I let you rule. And I, who, in the barracks, among the soldiers, gave commands, was with you, the one who obeyed. I grew up at your side, looked up to you as though to a superior being, listened to you as though I was your ignorant child. Yes, that's how it was. I loved you as my child. But, do you know, I suppose you noticed it. Every time your feelings towards me changed, and you approached me as my lover, I felt bashful, and your embrace was an ecstasy followed by pangs of conscience, as though my blood was ashamed. The mother became the mistress. Ugh. Yes, I saw it, but I didn't understand. I thought you despised my lack of masculinity and I wanted to win you as a woman by being a man. That was your mistake. The mother was your friend, you see. But the woman was your enemy. Love between man and a woman is war. And don't think I gave myself. I didn't give. I took what I wanted to have. But you had the upper hand. I felt it, and I wanted to make you feel it. No, you were always the one who had the upper hand. You could hypnotise me so that I neither saw nor heard, but only obeyed. You could give me a raw potato and make me think it was a peach. You could force me to admire your stupid whims as strokes of genius. You could have driven me to crime, yes, even to vice, for you lacked intelligence and instead of following my advice you did as you wanted but when later i awoke and looked about me and saw that my honor had been sullied i wanted to wipe out the stain through a noble action a brave deed a discovery or, or an honorable suicide i wanted to go to war but i couldn't it was then that i turned to science now now 
when I should stretch out my hand to receive the fruits of my labor, you chop off my arm. Now I am without honor, and I cannot go on living, for a man cannot live without honor. But a woman... She has her children, but he has none. Yet you and I and all the other men and women in the world have gone on living as innocently as children, living on fancies, ideals and illusions, and, and then we awoke. Yes, we awoke. But with our feet on the pillow, and he who woke us was himself a sleepwalker. When women grow old and cease to be women, they get beards on their chins. I wonder what men get when they grow old and cease to be men. We who greeted the dawn were no longer cocks but capons. And the hens answered our false calls so that when the sun should have risen, we found ourselves sitting in moonlight among the ruins. Just like in the good old days. It had only been a fretful slumber, a wild dream. It was no awakening. Thank you, guys. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's very, very Shylock, the beginning of that, isn't it? Sorry? It's very Shylock, the beginning of that. Yeah, no, I think that's deliberate. It's, that's always been quite a difficult passage to, how do you, do, how do you play that passage? Because it is lifted from Shylock. And the question is, does he want it to be lifted from Shylock or does he want it to be ironically lifted from Shylock? It's, it's, he's equating, he's equating, having equated himself as a black slave, he's now doing it as a persecuted Jew. So it's quite, it's quite certainly uh, feeling pretty miserable about himself. But what's astonishing about it, if you listen to what they're saying, is, is they're talking about almost Freudian psychology about men and women and sexuality uh, in a way that you can absolutely see why no one had a clue what was going on and couldn't understand what they were saying. And it's very dark. I mean, it's very, probably his darkest play. Um, and that's, uh, it doesn't have a happy ending. Uh, at the end of it, he finally has a stroke. Um, all, all, everyone decides that he is mad. Um, he, at one point he tries to shoot himself, but they've stolen the gun, pistols, uh, the bullets from his gun, uh, which is a great image of sort of, um, castration uh, and then ultimately the nurse who's looked after him all his life uh, who's when he was a child coaxes him into a straight jacket uh, and at the end he has a stroke and dies so it's not exactly a, a jolly comedy um, but it was uh, incredibly powerful in its day it was revolutionary it's very dark I think it's quite frightening now I think if you put the whole play on now it would still be very hard to watch um, Michael Merrill's used to say that a really good production of a Strindberg is almost unbearable to watch uh, and this, as you can see, is why is why he's so potent. So this was uh, these plays. These are the plays where his supposed reputation for misogyny come from. Um, but there is a what he's really writing about is what happens to men and women when they're in their darkest place, when a marriage breaks up, when a relationship breaks up, where people aren't necessarily um, talking rationally, and also that awful situation where two people who were once in love the cruelty they can then visit on each other in, in those fights can actually be just as powerful as the, as the love they once had. So um, it was incredibly dark, uh, but then uh, the marriage ended um, and Strindberg essentially uh, ran away. He, he, he fled the life he was living. Um, there was a long protracted divorce, paternity cases, all those different things. And Strindberg wound up in uh, Paris, um, and this is where he went through something called the Inferno period. And this is where his whole conception of himself and his plays completely changed once again. He never quite, he only, he didn't let go of um, naturalistic dramas. He went on to write an extraordinary couple of plays called The Dance of Death, uh, which is a weird kind of black comedies about, about a, a tortuous marriage. But again, in that one, interestingly enough, uh, it's completely evenly matched between the husband and the wife. It's, it's very darkly funny. Um, but they, but again, it's, 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 it's who's afraid of Virginia Woolf is heavily uh, borrowed from it. Uh, but when he was in Paris, um, he, he gave up on literature and he decided to immerse himself not just in science, but also the esoteric. And he started to study alchemy and Swedenborg, who was a Swedish mystic who claimed to communicate with angels and demons. And he immersed himself in Hinduism and Buddhism. 
uh, and uh, carried out, um, he lived in a hotel, in, in rooms in a hotel, and he carried out his own uh, chemical and alchemical investigations. And one of the things you would have noticed in, in, those, in those, both those things, reference to hypnotism, Strindberg was fascinated by hypnotism and the idea of, of psychological control people could have on each other. And this is a theme in these early plays where the characters psychologically try and fight each other and invariably the woman tends to succeed um and he coined a term called soul murder uh, i don't know what, he, what it is in Sw i wouldn't want to pronounce it in, 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 in swedish the idea that, that although uh you don't you can't just necessarily kill someone with a weapon you can destroy their soul through um emotional or mental kind of um uh torture and while he was in Paris, he underwent a massive mental breakdown. Uh, he was struggling with the pain of the loss of his marriage and all of those different things. He was immersing himself in the occult uh, and he uh, effectively went into breakdown. Um, uh, but during this process of, of the breakdown, he started having visions and hallucinations and he underwent this strange kind of religious reawakening. Um, at the time, Paris was absolutely a center of the occult. There were all sorts of kind of Freemasons and Rosicrucians and other orders bopping around um, doing unusual things um, and uh, the most significant of these uh, were was Swedenborg for him now the reason why Swedenborg is interesting that if, if you go to Russell Square in London you'll find a hotel uh, with a plaque outside it saying this is where Swedenborg lived now Swedenborg was a scientist and also a, a religious thinker um, and one he was visiting England in Russell Square and he was lying in his hotel room and he woke up and there was a shining figure of light in his room and this finding figure of light told him that he was an angel uh, and that he had come to give information about the universe to Swedenborg. And Swedenborg uh, and that a new awakening was about to happen. Um, uh, so this is commemorated on this on this plaque. So Swedenborg became psychic and he started to talk about uh, the cosmos. He went. He claimed that he had voyages to heaven and to hell, and he met angels and demons. That angels were humans who had evolved in a higher level, and demons were humans who had sunk too too low. And Strindberg started to understand this cosmology of suffering. Trying suffering he'd underwent and what Strindberg what he found when he was reading the Buddha when he was reading Hinduism was the idea that the world was Maya that it was illusion that it was full of suffering uh, and that, that the true mystics saw beyond that into the spirit world uh, and that in some kind of sense because suffering was the journey of the soul purifying itself and once he'd, he wrote an extraordinary d account of this breakdown called The Inferno, which is a kind of diary, which is full of these hallucinations, paranoid fantasies, but also incredible insights, uh, expressions of remorse. Uh, and he started to uh, change his view of, of and on trying to make sense of pain. And out of this comes this amazing um, experimentation in the last second half of his life, where he started to write these plays, which were pitched somewhere between our world and the spirit world, where he was trying to create um, a sense of life as a dream. He was trying to penetrate the veil of Maya. Uh, and the plays start to become expressionistic and non-naturalistic and hypnotic. Uh, and, uh, um, and the women, rather than being destroyers, start to become figures of salvation as very much, um, and, his, and his male characters start to seek forgiveness and healing. Uh, and some kind of spiritual regeneration. So there's a complete transformation. And this is the side of Strindberg that isn't talked about. When people talk about him being a misogynist, they're just really looking at the conflicts in his early plays. In the second half of his life, he was on this, his last play was called The Great Highway. <laughs> uh, last, so he was on this spiritual journey where he's trying to understand the collapse in his mind, the collapse of his marriage and make sense of it all. Uh, he also underwent two other uh, marriages, one to Frida All, which lasted for about 30 seconds, and she then went off to marry Vedekind. Um, so she was obviously appeal appealed to very strange, obsessive male playwrights at the time. And the last was a young actress called Harriet Bosser, and they were very much in love, uh, and he wrote wonderful plays for her, and then that relationship fell apart, and he wrote torture plays about that. So all his plays tended to come out of his crises. So the next play we're looking at is this play called To Damascus. Now, this is, um, again, it's only ever been done in a, in, a, in a version up in Scotland, and it's three plays. Um, with a name like To Damascus, the obvious thing is it is about Paul's spiritual journey. And the play, in some sense, is an the first play uh, is an account of Strindberg's own process of, 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 of change. Um, and in the play, uh, the main character, as we've talked about before, is the stranger. And when I gave the actors this scene to look at, I gave them a reference to the Ingmar Bergman film, 
Wild Strawberries, the dream sequence where he sees his own corpse. Uh, and that's the atmosphere of the play. The, the play is, is not naturalistic. It's very weird. Um, it's, it's, it, each scene is another step along this journey that the stranger goes on. And in the opening scene, um, uh, none of the characters have got names. The main character is called the stranger. The secondary main character is called the lady. Uh, everybody in some sense is, is heightened. Um, and you can't tell in the play whether, whether, whether at certain points Strindberg's taking the piss because it's so weird uh, or whether he's absolutely straight up what he's saying. Um, so this first scene is the very, very beginning. Uh, the, the, the curtain comes up or the lights come up and you're in a street somewhere in, in Sweden. We don't know where. And the stranger is on his own and he's drawing in the sand. Take it away, Alan. So... There you are. I thought you'd come. You called me then. Yes, I felt it. But why do you stand here, on the street corner? I don't know. I must stand somewhere while I wait. What are you waiting for? If I only knew. For 40 years I've been waiting for something. I believe it is called happiness. Or it may just be the end of sorrow. Listen to that dreadful music again. Listen. Don't go. Please don't go. I shall be frightened if you go. We met yesterday for the first time and talked alone for four hours. I felt sorry for you, but that doesn't mean you may take advantage of my kindness. That's true. I shouldn't. But I beg you, don't leave me alone. I'm in a strange city. I haven't a friend. And the few people I know seem worse than strangers, almost enemies. Enemies everywhere. Alone everywhere. Why did you leave your wife and child? Uh, if I only knew. If I only knew why I exist. Why I stand here. Where I must go. What I must do. Do you think some people are damned before they die? No. I don't think that. Look at me. Have you never found any happiness in life? No. And when I thought I had, it was just a ruse to tempt me to prolong my misery. Whenever the golden fruit fell into my hand, it was always poisoned or rotten. What is your religion? Only this, that when life becomes too much to bear, I shall go my way. Where? Into annihilation. This knowledge that I hold death in my hand gives me an incredible feeling of power. Good God, you speak of death like a toy. Well, life is a toy to us writers. I was born melancholy, yet I've never been able to take anything seriously. Even my own sorrows. And there are moments when I doubt whether life has any more reality than the things I write. Here they come again. Why must they march round the streets like this? Are you afraid of them? No, but it irritates me. It's as though it had happened before. I don't fear death, only solitude. Because when one's alone, there's always someone else. I don't know whether it's myself or someone else, but in solitude, one is never alone. The air grows thicker. It begins to sprout, to grow things which you can't see, but which are there and alive. You've noticed that? Yes. I've been noticing everything lately. Not just things and incidents, forms and colours. Now I see thoughts and what they signify. Life used to be just a great nonsense. Now it has meaning and I see a purpose in it where before I saw only a game of chance. So when I met you yesterday, I thought you had been sent either to save me or to destroy me. Why should I destroy you? Because it was your destiny. I don't want to destroy you. I pity you. 
I've never seen anyone before whose mere appearance made me want to weep. What's on your conscience? Have you done something that hasn't been found out or punished? You may well ask that. I have no more crimes on my conscience than many who go free. Yes, one thing. I wasn't willing to be life's fool. One must let oneself be betrayed in some degree to be able to live. I've been accused of everything. No man was ever so hated or so lonely. I went alone and I came alone. When I entered a public place, people moved away from me. When I wanted to rent a room, it was always taken. The priests cursed me from the pulpits, the scholars from their lecture platforms, my parents in my home. Once the church committee tried to take my children from me. Then I raised my fist to heaven and reviled God. Why are you so hated? I don't know. Yes. I couldn't see people suffer. And I said so. And I wrote, free yourselves and I will help you. And I said to the poor, don't let the rich exploit you. And to the women, don't let men crush you. And, which I suppose is the worst, I said to children, do not obey your father and mother when they are unjust. The result was, <sighs> everyone united against me, rich and poor, men and women, parents and children. I became sick, poor, beggared, dishonored, divorced, denounced, exiled, alone, and now, do you think I'm mad? No. You're the only one who doesn't. I like you for that. Good, thank you very much. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay, so now that, it's really interesting. I've never, that's the first time I have ever heard that scene delivered. Uh, and I've read this play many, many times, and I've, I thought, should I do this? Should I, do this? I don't know. Uh, but I've never heard it delivered. And what was, what's, you can, you can hear in, in that scene, it's a beautiful, beautiful scene, totally different to the, to the darker plays. Um, but at the same time, you can hear, it goes all the way back to, remember, to what I said about Master Roloff and how he was when he was younger. Um, and this is very much Strimbo putting his midlife crisis on the, on the, on the stage. I always think that, that waking up in the, in the um, street is like the Dante line, like one that I, I woke up in the middle of a dark wood. Um, but what's brilliant about it, it's beautifully read by both of you, is that although there's no self-pity in it, do you know what I mean? Although he's talking about his pain, there's wit in it, there's humour, there's irony, and it's not self-pity. If it becomes self-pity, it would be intolerable. So, and you also you can see how different the lady is to the women that he's dealt with before. Yes, it's, she's slightly idealised. Uh, it's his soul in many ways, but it's a different image of what a woman is, and what, what femininity might be. And as you can see, as I say, he's looking for forgiveness. He's looking for salvation. As he says, you'll either save me or you'll destroy me, because that is what had happened to him before, or that's what he failed to happen to him before when he was with Siri. And he was writing this, I think either for which wife it was, but it was he was newly in a relationship. Um, uh, I think it was Harriet Bosser. Um, and um, so there was full of hope, uh, but there was this enormous pain that was going on. So in the play, uh, he um, goes off with her. She's already married as with Strimbo's other plays. And it turns out that the man she's married to used to know the trade when they were at school. So he's a doctor. So he takes her away, they go off into the mountains and they stay with her family. And one of the things that um, strange, the strange, who are kind of peasants up in the mountains, and one of the things the stranger tells her is you mustn't read my books, don't read my books. He doesn't want her to read her books. In other words, please don't read the father. <laughs> because if you read the father, you'd be horrified by it. Now in the play, she does read the books and she decides she can't be with him. So she leaves him and he waits wakes himself wakes up um, and she's gone now the thing there is that is that her parents don't like him uh, and he's left in the house and the mother in particular despises him knows who he is and thinks he's bad news um, and uh, she's also very religious and uh, at a key moment and this is the key moment in the play which is the, Dam the Damascus moment where he's he's sleeping in a haunted bedroom uh, and he hears movement in the night uh, and he wakes up 
take it away, Alex, Alan, and Karen. Is there anyone there? No one. What's that moving on the floor? Is there anyone there? Is there anyone here? Jesus Christ! Are you still up? Yes, I couldn't sleep. Why, my son? There was someone walking upstairs. Impossible. There's no room above that one. That's what disturbed me. What's that moving on the floor like snakes? The moonlight. Yes, it's the moonlight. And there is a stuffed bird, and there are kitchen cloths. Everything's normal and natural. It's just that that disturbs me. Who's that knocking? Has someone been shut out? No, it's a horse kicking in the stable. Really? Yes. There are horses that suffer from the nightmare. What is a nightmare? Who knows? Let me sit down for a moment. Sit down and let me talk seriously to you. I was cruel to you last night and I ask you to forgive me. But because I am so cruel, I use religion as I use a hair shirt and a stone floor. If it will ease your mind, I will tell you what the nightmare is. It is my evil conscience. Whether it is I or somebody else that punishes me, I don't know, and I don't think I have the right to ask. Now, tell me, what happened to you in that room? I really don't know. I didn't see anything. But when I went in, I felt someone was there. I looked with my candle, but found no one. Then I went to bed. And then someone began to walk with heavy steps above my head. Do you believe in ghosts and spirits? No, my religion forbids that. But I believe in the power of conscience to create means of chastisement. Well, after a moment, I felt an icy stream of air against my breast, groping until it found my heart. Then my heart went cold and I had to get out of bed. And then? Then I found myself pinned to the floor and I saw the whole panorama of my life unroll before me, everything, everything. And that was the worst. Yes, I know all that. I have been through it. There's no name for that sickness and only one cure. What? You know. You know what children have to do when they've done wrong. What must they do? First, ask for forgiveness. And then? Try to make things right. Isn't it enough to suffer according to one's deserts? No. That's just revenge. Well, what else? Can you make good a life you've destroyed? Can you undo a wicked deed? No, that's true. I was forced to do that deed. I was forced to take because nobody gave me. But shame on him who forced me. Ah, uh, uh, now he's here in this room. He's tearing the heart from my breast. Ah. Uh, Humble yourself. I can't. On your knees. I won't. Christ have mercy upon you. Lord have mercy on your knees to him who was crucified for us. Only he can undo what has been done. No, not to him, not to him. And if I'm forced to do it, I'll take it back later. On your knees, my son. I can't kneel. I can't. Help me, eternal God. Well... Do you feel better? Yes. But you know what that was? It wasn't death. It was annihilation. Annihilation of the Godhead in you. 
We call that spiritual death. I see. Now I begin to understand. My son, you have left Jerusalem and are on the road to Damascus. Go there by the same route you came and plant a cross at every station, but stop at the seventh. You don't have to suffer 14 like him. You speak in riddles. Well, get up. Go and search out those to whom you have something to say. It is beginning to grow light. The dawn is here. The night is over. Have you noticed that before the sun rises, we mortals shiver? Are we children of darkness that we tremble before the coming of the light? Do you never tire of asking questions? Never. You see, I long for the light. Go now and peace be with you. You're amazing. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Again, a, a scene I've never heard read. It's a, it's a phenomenal scene and it's very much about what Strindberg was going through and you can see all the hallucinations. And actually, when you find out about his background at this point, the things he describes about the ghosts and, the, and seeing thoughts and everything, these are the hallucinations he was having. And he insisted that they weren't hallucinations. So uh, what happens then is that he's forced to return all the way through. So you, before this, you, you see him and the lady tra travel through to uh, her parents. He then has to go back and apologize, almost like a recovering alcoholic, to, to everybody that he's hurt until he's finally returned to the lady at the, where he met her at the beginning. And the beauty of the end is that the whole, the whole play has a kind of symmetry. And at the end of the play, he meets her again in the same place where he was drawing in the sand. And it's outside a church. And this is their final scene. What are you doing? I'm drawing in the sand, still. Don't you hear any songs? Yes, but from in there, there's someone I wronged without knowing it. I thought our wandering was nearing our end, now that we're back here. Where we started, in the street, between the cafe and the church and the post office. Post office. E-O-S-T. I say, I didn't leave a registered letter here uncollected. Yes, but it contained something bad. Or a writ. Oh. There it is again. Go and fetch it and believe it may contain something good. Good? Believe it. Try to imagine it. I'll try. Well? I am ashamed. It was money. You see? All this misery, all these tears, for nothing. No, not for nothing. It seems horrible, this game. But perhaps it's not. I wronged the invisible one when I suspected him. Hush. Don't try to shift the blame. No, it was my own stupidity. Or wickedness. I didn't want to become life's fool, and so I became it. But the powers... Have returned the changeling. Let us go. Yes. Let us return to your mountains and hide, yourself, hide ourselves with our griefs. Yes, the mountains hide. But first, I must light a candle to my blessed Saint Elizabeth. Come. Well, I can always go in with you, but I won't stay. You don't know. Come. In there, you will hear new songs. Perhaps. Come. And at that point, they go into the church, and the end of the, that's the end of the play. I've always thought if I was to do it, you'd have a wonderful burst of kind of choral 
music at that point. So it's again, you can see it's a quest for peace, it's a quest for healing, it's a quest for some kind of resolution. And it's again, this is the whole side, these plays aren't done in this country. So this is a whole side of him that people don't know. Mm. Um, now, uh, there's two more plays that we're going to look at briefly. So the next one is a dream play, beautifully read, thank you to Hannah and Alan. Um, the next play is a dream play. Now, this was Strindberg's favourite play. Of everything that he wrote, it was the one that meant the most to him. Uh, and I've directed this. I did this with American students, and it was unbelievably hard. And one of the reasons was that the American students themselves couldn't deal with the pessimism in the play. Uh, they couldn't deal with the, with the very European sort of heavy philosophy. They, they were rebelling against it. They wanted something much warmer. The dream play, as the name suggests, was his effort to try and write a play that was like a dream. And this is his play, if... Um, um, uh, to Damascus is steeped in Swedenborg and the whole vision of Christ and suffering and purgation. The dream play is the one that's most steeped in Hinduism and Buddhism. And it's one of the most, uh, and it's all about the idea. One of the literal ideas of Maya is that reality, real, real existence, material existence is an illusion. It's Maya. Uh, in Buddhism, it's samsara, endless wandering and the lack of fulfillment in this world. And the play um, uh, follows Indra's daughter. So uh, the idea is that the god Indra, who's one, um, one of the, uh, uh, an Indian god, the Hindu god of fire, I think, that in Tamil Nadu is still the primary god. Uh, at the beginning of the play, uh, Indra is outside um, uh, our solar system. System. and Indra's daughter can hear the words, the sounds coming up from the earth and she decides she wants to descend into the, into the world and understand what it is to be human. So she takes on human form, the whole opening section is out in the ether, um, and she takes on human form and she goes on this extraordinary phantasmagoric uh, barking mad kind of vision of everything where she tries everything, she explores marriage, she witnesses lawyers, she law, religion, human suffering, disease, illness. It's, it's like the classic um, uh, Buddha story of, of, of uh, the Buddha exiting her, his uh, palace and seeing um, a dead man, a sick man and an old man, and understanding about suffering. And all the way through, she tries to save people and she encounters the best of humanity and the worst of humanity. Um, but ultimately her vision is that, is that life is suffering. It's the classic Buddhist vision. Um, and um, uh, it's a very extraordinary, he wrote, again, he wrote the part for Harriet Bosser, who was his third wife. And as, if you look on the internet, you'll find beautiful images there for her playing this part. And a very odd uh, recording of her delivering some of it, which is written in poetry and doing it like a kind of weird incantation. Um, but it's an astonishing play because it confronts suffering, but also there are these wonderful moments of spirituality and beauty and even humor. Uh, and at the end of the play, which is the scene that we're going to look at, uh, Indra's daughter, the one character, there are two, two, three male characters that she engages with. At the beginning, it's a soldier who's a kind of young idealistic lover. Then she, then she marries a, a lawyer, an, an advocate for kind of human rights, kind of Keir Starmer figure. Um, and that marriage goes badly wrong. And, and the idea of the lawyer is he's always trying to do good, but ultimately he's defeated by the fact that, that, that life is so painful and stressful and at the third character that becomes a kind of connection with her is the poet who's the only one in the whole thing who seems to have a, a vision of something outside and there are two wonderful scenes that the poet has with Indra's daughter where he has an audience with her and, and that he shares wisdom with her and she shares wisdom with him and I remember doing this and giving the uh, uh, quite a tricky note to give an actor is is can you imagine what it would be like to have five minutes with a deity five minutes with a god where the god was present and the god was willing to talk to you about what was going on. So the, this, this scene we're about to look at is the very, very last scene in the play where Indra's daughter has gone through this extraordinary journey. Oh, one thing I wanted to say, there's, there's a, um, uh, I don't know if anybody knows about Sufism, um, uh, Islamic mysticism, but there's a wonderful theory concept within Sufism, which is this, the descent and the ascent of the soul. And the idea is that the human soul incarnates into this world from God and, and becomes human and forgets where, where it's from. And then at a certain point, the soul wakes up and remembers where it's from, which is, which is the divine and, and God. And at that point, uh, the soul's quest is to, is to return. And in many ways, that's the story that he's um, uh, written here, where she, she descends and she becomes human. And then at the end of the play, she reascends. And the last person she speaks to is the poet. So in this scene, uh, Indra's daughter is preparing what's called the fire ritual. So she's going to burn off her, her physical form. And then once she's been released from her physical form, she's going to return to her father, Indra, who's also uh, seen as God. And in this scene, the poet, who is alone with her now and is the last person to speak to her, tries to use the time to get the wisdom that he needs. Do you want to unmute yourselves, Danny and Aluli? Mm -hmm. The moment is nigh. 
when consumed with fire, I shall rise again into the ether. That is what you call death, and which you approach with fear. The fear of the unknown. Which you know. Who knows it? Everyone. Why don't you believe your prophets? Prophets have always been mistrusted. Why is that? And if God has spoken, why do people not believe? His word should be irresistible. Have you always doubted? No, I have often felt certain. But after a while, my certainty always departed, like a dream when one awakes. It is not easy to be mortal. You see it and admit it? Yes. Tell me, was it not Indra who once sent his son to earth to listen to man's complaints? It was. How was he received? How did he perform his mission to answer with a question? To answer with another. Was not man's condition better after he visited? Answer truthfully. Better? Yes, a little. Very little. But instead of asking, will you answer me the riddle? Yes, but to what purpose? You will not believe me. I will believe you, for I know who you are. Well, I will tell you. In the morning of time, before the sun shone, Brahma, the divine primal force, allowed Maja, the world mother, to induce him to multiply himself. This contact between the divine element and the earthly element was heaven's sin. Thus it is that the world, life and mankind are but a phantom, an illusion, a dream vision. My dream. A true dream. But to be liberated from the earthly elements, Brahma's descendants crave privation and suffering. So, suffering is the liberator. But this need for suffering conflicts with the human desire for pleasure and with love. Do you yet understand what love is, with its sharpest joys inseparable from sharpest suffering, happiest when it is most bitter? Do you yet understand what woman is, woman through whom sin and death entered into life? I understand. And the end? That you know. The strife between the agony of ecstasy and the ecstasy of agony, the pangs of the penitent, and the joys of voluptuousness. Strife, then. Strife between opposites generates power, just as fire and water generate steam. But peace, rest. Hush, you must ask no more and I may not reply. The altar is already decked for the sacrifice. The flowers stand guard, the candles are lit. The white sheets cover the windows. The fir twigs lie in the porch. You say this as calmly as though suffering did not exist for you. Not exist? I have suffered all your torments a hundredfold, for my perceptions were finer. Tell me your sorrows. Poet, if you could tell me yours and there was a word for every grief, could your words ever match the truth? No, you are right. To myself, I always seem like a deaf mute. And when the mob listened in wonder to my song, it sounded to me like discord. That is why I was always ashamed when men praised me. And you want me to? Look me in the eyes. I cannot endure your glance. Then how could you endure my words if I spoke my tongue? Tell me before you go. What did you suffer from most down here? From being human, from feeling my sight weakened by my eyes, my hearing muffled by my ears and my thought, my light, airy thought, cabined by the windings of a brain. You have seen a brain. What twistings, what rat holes. Yes, and, and that is why all right-thinking people think twistedly. Cruel, always cruel. But you all are. How can one be otherwise? Our parting is at hand. The end approaches. Farewell, you child of man, you dreamer, you poet who best knowest how to live. Hovering on wings above the earth, you plunge occasionally into the mire to shake it from your feet, not to stick fast. 
now I am going. In the moment of goodbye, when one must be parted from a friend, a place, how suddenly great the loss of what one loved, regret for what one shattered. Oh, now I feel the agony of existence. So this is to be mortal. One even misses what one did not value. One even regrets crimes one did not commit. One wants to go and one wants to stay. The twin halves of the heart are wrenched asunder and one is torn as between raging horses of contradictions, irresolution, discord. Farewell. Tell your brothers and sisters I shall remember them in the place to which I return and in your name shall set their griefs before the throne of God. Farewell. Amazing, thank you very much. Yeah. That is incredible. <laughs> yeah, it's an amazing, extraordinary piece of writing. Uh, beautifully read by both of you. Um, yeah, that was, I was uh, shivers down the spine on that one. It was absolutely amazing. And I mean, again, beautiful. I mean, absolutely beautiful. And again, as I say, people think of, of Strindberg as this pessimistic, dark, dismal playwright. And yet there he was uh, confronting human suffering and, and, and turning it into something absolutely beautiful uh, and extraordinary. As I say, just, just writing this play, which, which was, it's probably the most influenced by Eastern philosophy and mysticism of any other play that I can think of. Uh, and, and love Ibsen though I do, I don't think he got close to that. Do you know what I mean? That wasn't somewhere where, where he went. Um, uh, so enormous kind of soul and beauty there. Now, uh, um, tragically, uh, he didn't find peace. Um, uh, the rest of his life was not easy. He did eventually, uh, he, he had this play performed, no one liked it. Uh, and he wrote a few more plays, and no one liked them either. Uh, and the last great play that he wrote was, was, was The Ghost Sonata, where, where he was um, uh, limping, as it were, towards the end of his life. This was the early 1900s. I think he died in 1912, two years before the First, Second First World War. Uh, now, The Ghost Sonata is an absolutely stunning play. Uh, again, it's very, very short. You can read it very, very quickly. I remember reading it at the age of 16 and feeling at the end of it that I'd actually died, um, that, that it's, it's, it's so powerful. And for years, I didn't read it again, and I only read it again recently. Never performed in the UK. The only time it's ever been performed in the UK was on, not on stage, I mean, it's been performed on television, bizarrely, with Donald Pleasance. Um, and it's been done as a, as a puppet show. I think a Swedish company brought it here. Now the ghost sonata is kind of what it suggests. Uh, if a dream play is a little bit like a, a dream, a ghost sonata is set almost in the afterlife. Um, it's set in this mysterious world um, where you can't tell whether um, you're seeing reality or you're seeing a dream or you're seeing the dead. Um, and um, it has these strange, strange echoes of things like the Adams family or the monsters in that it's it's this it's th three scenes and in each scene the first scene starts outside this house the second scene is inside the house and then the next scene is deeper inside the house into this special uh, garden lotus garden I think it is um, and um, it's 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 Strimbo's kind of we, we, we talked about the late place of Shakespeare it's like his last will and testament his last kind of um, statement about life and he talked about it as Karma Loka the world of karma um, and he wanted it to have the quality of, 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 of the living and the dead, of the psychic, of the person sh echoed by shades. The story is quite hard to summarise. Um, in the first scene, you're outside the house and the main character appears to be this young student who's just spent uh, the night before rescuing people from a collapsed house. Um, and he comes, falls into conversation with an old man in a wheelchair who um, seems to take him under his wing. Um, uh, but the inference is that, that the old man uh, knew the student's father and destroyed him, it got him into debt, ruined him, and then took his possessions. Uh, but, and it turns out in the play that the old man's goal is to get inside the house, because inside the house is the woman that he's loved all his life, uh, and he's in, in a kind of quest, even in the last stages of his life, to, to finally be with her. Uh, and it turns out that all his life, this is what he's done, is ruin people, take their money. But all of it has been to get uh, into the house and be with this woman. And the house is a grand old house. And at certain moments, you see fleeting people in the windows. Uh, you see an old colonel. You see, uh, and you also see a beautiful young woman who's called the daughter. Uh, and the student falls in love with the daughter. And um, the old man persuades her, uh, that's, okay, we'll go into the house and I'll make sure that you get the daughter, but you'll have to take me in. And it turns out that what he's doing is using the student to get into the house. Once he gets into the house, and this is the, the beauty is that, is that it, with, if you're staging it, you're slowly peeling away 
these elements of reality. And when he gets into the house, you find this extraordinary kind of haunted house scenario uh, with all these strange old people who gather each day for what's called the ghost tea. They all sit around the table and they have this strange kind of um, tea. Uh, and uh, it, what's beautiful about it are these two servants who are completely real, who are the only characters in the play who've got real names, who talk like real people, who have been asked to work in this bizarre place, which is like a haunted house or a ghost train. Uh, and in one of the rooms, there's this door, and inside it is what's called the mummy. And this is the woman that, that um, oh, the old man Hummel has been in love with all his life. And she's now half mad, she's got stark white hair, and she's wrapped in uh, um, mummy's sort of uh, bandages. And, and she talks like a parrot. So uh, you enter this and it's, it's, so you're sitting there going, what the hell am I watching? What am I reading? And it is a kind of nightmare zone where, where um, it, it's sort of, um, it's, a, it's, it's the afterlife where souls are still trapped. Um, and at a key moment in the play, and this, the second, so the first scene is very much about the student and Hummel. The second scene is about Hummel seeking out this woman that he loves. And he finally thinks he's got her, but also he thinks he's conquered the house. Uh, he's, he's taken the power of the house. Uh, and he sits with them finally at this, at this dinner table for the ghost tea. Uh, and uh, it, it, everybody realizes that actually, as he's done with everybody else, he's ruined the house. He's financially taken them, so he now has control. And in this scene, um, uh, this is the scene where he sits with them and he thinks he's got his power. The other two characters in the scene, three characters in the scene, one is the Colonel, only speaks at the beginning. Now, one of the things, um, one of the things in this play is again, it's exploring the whole uh, idea of Maya and, and the Buddhist idea that our self, our idea of self, is just the construct. The goal is to slowly remove it until there's nothing left. Uh, and the way these characters undo each other is to reveal to each other who they really are so all these different characters who think they're colonels and lawyers and all these different things are slowly unraveled uh, so the other characters in it is uh, um, is the mummy who is also now sitting at the table and she speaks and she remembers uh, Hummel she knows who Hummel is and although we think she's mad she remembers him and there is the love there and at the end is Benson who's one of the servants take it away Felicity, you might need to unmute. And Alan, do you want to unmute? You're still muted, Felicity. Yeah. There you go. All right. Off you go, Danny. Shall we talk then? About the weather, which we know. Ask after each other's health. We know that too. I prefer silence. Then one can hear thoughts and see the past. Silence hides nothing, words conceal. I read the other day that differences of language arose through the need of primitive peoples to keep their tribal secrets private. Languages are ciphers, it's only a question of finding the key. But secrets can be exposed without the key especially when it's a question of proving one's parentage. Legal proof is another matter, of course. A couple of false witnesses can furnish that, provided their testimonies agree. But in cases such as the one I have in mind, there are no witnesses, for nature has endowed man with a sense of shame, which seeks to hide that which should be hid. Nevertheless, the time sometimes comes when that which is most secret must be revealed, when the mask is stripped from the deceiver's face, when the identity of the criminal is exposed. Mm. What a silence. Here, for example, in this respectable house, this exquisite home, where beauty, culture, and wealth are united. We who sit here, we know what we are. Hmm? I don't need to underline that. And you all know me, though you pretend you don't. In that room sits my daughter. Yes, mine. You know that too. She has lost the desire to live. She doesn't know why. 
This air foul with crime and treachery and falsehood has withered her. I've tried to find her a friend through whom she may discover light and warmth. The light and warmth that a noble action engenders. That was why I came to this house. To burn out the weeds. Expose the crimes. Balance the ledger. So that these young people may start life afresh in the home which I have given them. Now, I give you leave to depart in peace, each of you in your turn. Anyone who stays, I shall have arrested. Listen to the clock ticking. The clock of death on the wall. Do you hear what she's saying? Tis time. Tis time. In a little while, she will strike and your time will be up. Then you may depart, but not till then. But before she strikes, she whispers this threat. Listen, she's warning you. The clock can strike. I too can strike. Strikes the table with his crutch. The mummy goes over to the clock and stops the pendulum. But I can halt time. I can wipe out the past, undo what has been done, not with bribes, not with threats, but through suffering and contrition. We are weak, pitiable creatures. We know that. We have erred and sinned like all mortals. We are not what we seem. For our true selves live within us, condemning our failings. But you, Jacob Homo, sit here wearing your false name and judge us. Proves you worse than us, wretched as we are. You are not what you seem any more than we are. You are a robber of souls, for you have robbed me of mine with your false promises. You murdered the consul that Bay buried today. You strangled him with your notes of hand. And now you have stolen the student's soul for a feigned debt of his father who never owed you a penny. The old man has tried to rise and interrupt her, but has fallen back in his chair and shrunk small. During what follows, he shrinks smaller and smaller. But there is a black spot in your life. I don't know the full truth about it, but I can guess. And I fancy Bengston knows. She rings the bell on the table. Bengston, do you know this man? Yes, I know him and he knows me. Life has its ups and downs. He has served in my house, as I now serve in this one. He hung around my cook for two years. So that he could get away by three o'clock, we had to have dinner ready by two. And then we had to make do with the warmed up remains of what he'd left. He drank the juice from the meat too. He sat there like a vampire, 
sucking all the goodness out of our home and left us skeletons. Then, when we called the cook a thief, he had us put in prison. Later, I met this man in Hamburg under another name. He'd become a usurer, another kind of bloodsucker. Besides which, he was accused of having lured a young girl out on the ice to drown her because she'd been witness to a crime he was afraid it might get discovered. The mummy puts her hand over the old man's face. You see yourself? Now give me your notes of hand and the deeds of the house. End of scene. Thank you very much. Amazing. Um, so deeply mysterious. You can see Beckett in there. You can see huge kind of echoes with Beckett e echoing behind that. Again, I've never heard this read out loud. It's the most astonishing piece of writing um, and deeply mysterious. And again, you can see his despair in it, but also his idea that you have to purge this darkness for things to happen. So the last scene of the play, and this is the last one we'll, we'll look at, this is all left behind. The older characters fade away and die and are reduced to nothing. And we're left in the, in the lilac room, I think it is, uh, which is the sort of um, uh, a ro so the hyacinth room, that's it, where um, the student and the daughter are now talking to each other. Uh, now, the, stu the daughter is dying. She's ill. Um, and the room is full of hyacinths, but also a statue of the Buddha. So again, he's putting in his, um, his imagery of, of the East. And in this scene, which, which ends with them, they're very much in love. Uh, she asks him um, uh, about his past uh, and things emerge. We, we, we discover that she's dying. And at the end of this scene is almost like Strindberg's final prayer for the human race. Now, as with the other one, I will read in the stage directions because there's quite vivid things going on. Take it away, please. Do you know what I'm thinking about you? Don't tell me. If you do, I shall die. I must, for I shall die. In madhouses, people say everything they think. I know. My father died in a madhouse. Was he sick? No. He was perfectly well, just mad. He only showed it once. I'll tell you how. He was surrounded, as we all are, by a circle of associates. He called them friends. The word was shorter and more convenient. They were a gang of scoundrels, of course. Most people are. But he had to have someone to talk to. He couldn't bear to be alone. One doesn't ordinarily tell people what one thinks of them, and neither did he. He knew they were false and treacherous, but he was a wise man and had been well brought up. So he was always polite to everyone. But one day he gave a great party. It was in the evening. He was tired after his day's work and tired of the strain of listening to his guests and exchanging spiteful gossip with them. The daughter shudders. Well, he, he rapped on the table for silence and stood up with his glass to make a speech. <laughs> then the safety catch flew off and he, as he talked he stripped the company naked, flinging the hypocrisy in their faces. Then he sat down exhausted on the middle of the table and told them all to go to hell. Oh. I was there and I shall never forget what happened next. My mother hit him. He hit her. The guests rushed for the door and father was taken to the madhouse where he died. Water which has remained stationary and silent for too long, becomes rotten. It's the, it's the same with this house. Something has rotted here too. And when I saw you walk through the door for the first time, I thought it was paradise. I, I stood there one Sunday morning and gazed in through the windows. I saw a colonel who was not a colonel. I found a noble benefactor who turned out to be a crook and had to hang himself. I saw a mummy that was not a mummy and a maid. Where is virginity to be found? Or beauty? 
only in flowers and trees. And in my head, when I am dressed in my Sunday clothes, where are faith and honor to be found? In fairy tales and games that children play. Where can I find anything that will fulfill its promise? Only in my imagination. Your flowers have poisoned me and I have poisoned you in return. I asked you to be my wife and share my home. We wrote poems, we sang and played. And then the cook came in, Sursum Kurda. Try once more to strike fire and purple from your golden harp. Try, I beg you. I command you. On my knees. Then I shall do it myself. Takes the harp, but no sound comes from the strings. It is deaf and dumb. Why should the most beautiful flowers be the most poisonous? It is a curse that hangs over all creation, all life. Why would you not be my bride? Because the lie, the source of life is poisoned in you. Now I can feel that vampire in the kitchen beginning to suck my blood. Perhaps she's a lamia who lives on the blood of children. It's always in the kitchen that children's hearts are nipped, if it hasn't already happened in the bedroom. There are poisons which blind and poisons which open the eyes. I must have been born with the second kind in my veins because I can't see beauty in ugliness or call evil good, I can't. Jesus Christ descended into hell when he wandered through this madhouse, this brothel, this morgue which we call earth. And the madman killed him when he tried to set them free and release the robber instead. The robber always gets the sympathy. Alas for us all, alas. Oh, saviour of the world, save us. We are dying. The daughter is crumpled in her chair. She rings, bangs and enters. Bring the screen, quickly. I am dying. Bengton comes back with the screen. She opens and places in front of the daughter. The deliverer cometh. Welcome, thou pale and gentle one, and you, beautiful, unhappy, innocent creature, who must suffer for the guilt of others. Sleep, sleep dreamlessly, and when you wake again, may you be greeted by a sun, a sun that will not burn, in a home without dust, by friends ignorant of dishonor, by a love that knows no imperfections. Oh, wise and gentle Buddha, who sitteth waiting for a heaven to rise up out of the earth, grant us patience in our time of trial, and grant us purity of will, that thy hopes may be fulfilled. The heart strings begin to whisper. The room becomes filled with the white light, and a voice speaks. I saw the sun. I seemed to see the hidden one. Man reaps as he sows. The doer of good shall receive blessing. Answer not with evil what was done in anger. Repay with goodness him thou hast robbed. He who hath done no wrong shall have naught to fear. Innocence is goodness. Moaning is heard from behind the screen. Unhappy child, born into this world of delusion, guilt, suffering and death this world that is forever changing forever erring forever in pain the lord of heaven be merciful to you on your journey the room disappears Bertin's painting of the island of the dead appears in the background soft music calm and gently melancholy right <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, yeah, everybody, my screen seems to have frozen, so I have absolutely no idea um, who can who heard any of that. So, I want to say that's the that's the journey of this, of Strindberg, um, and as you can see, an amazing body of work uh, with the most extraordinary um, variations. And you can see how what we know of him 
uh, is transformed in something that we don't know of him and these other extraordinary mystical late plays uh, which are so full of, of sorrow and, and beauty and suffering and compassion uh, tell us something else about him um, and uh, absolutely uh, presage what comes in the 20th century. Um, uh, as I say, he died in great agony, um, uh, hopefully believing that somehow his suffering made some kind of sense. Um, and you can hope I've made a good case as to why I think Strindberg is an important and an extraordinary playwright. So I have no idea who can hear me at this point, uh, but I want to say thank you to all my actors for their fantastic readings um, today. Uh, and thank you everybody for hanging on. We've overrun again, yet again. Uh, but an amazing experience. So we've got um, one more of these, which is going to be Chekhov. Uh, now, I'm not sure whether that will happen next week or we'll, or we'll stagger them from now on. Um, and after we've done Chekhov, uh, as I say, we'll take requests. So uh, we've, we've loved doing these. So there's one more to do of these seven great playwrights, the, the three Greek tragedians, Shakespeare, um, Ibsen, Strindberg, and then Chekhov. And then we can launch into whoever we want to look at after then. Uh, so I want to say a massive thanks to my actors once again. I'm not going to list them because I always forget someone. Um, uh, but I hope you'll join us for Chekhov. Um, and I want to say massive thanks for tonight. And see you all soon. Thank you very Thank much. You, Thank, Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Jake. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Wonderful. Take care. And read them in the record in the Michael Mayers. Brilliant stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.